sitting in the stream waiting patiently. Uh, you'll know that I've been trying to turn the stream on and off a few different times. It looks like Twitch is being pretty stingy with the transcodes, um, which is not great. Oh, thank God. Okay, we got him this time. This is going to be the last try anyway. Um, <clears throat> but looks like we got him. So sorry for the late start tonight. Uh, it wasn't just the technical issues. I, uh, I'm i starting a... So <clears throat> a little bit of a change in terms of what's going on with work. I'm starting up the game now, but this might take a minute to get everything running. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like at work, I've, uh, I've started a few... Um, I've started a new uh, French training course, which is something that I have been trying to get into for, it could, it's at least a year, probably longer. Um, but they sort of dropped two surprises on me. <clears throat> uh, one, uh, I have a preference for the afternoon lessons and they have always ignored that. Um, so they are, uh, they're morning sessions and they're actually an hour before I normally start. <clears throat> And uh, on top of that, I thought originally it was a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday affair, but it turns out that it is in fact, um, it is in fact uh, every weekday until the end of the month. So I am going to be, by the way, if you notice it loaded so fast, I put it on the SSD. So that gives me a little less time to talk, but that's fine because I'm, uh, I'm also looking to... <clears throat> um, I'm looking to uh, to try and, and spend more of the time recapping. It's been a while since we played Stellaris. Um, but what does this mean for the stream? Well, one, um, my sleeping schedule has been really tough and having such a hard start to the day um, is really messing, uh, that is really messing with me. Um, I know I've been late a couple of times because I just need to catch up on sleep and things like that. But um, I have a feeling what's gonna happen is uh, it'll be a double-edged sword. Um, in one sense, I'm going to have that much more of a... Um, I'm going to have that, that much more of sort of a... Um, uh, a, uh, a reason to sort of end at a really fixed time. Um, but on the other hand, uh, by doing that, <clears throat> it'll probably mean that the, uh, the starts are a little bit more consistent. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, that's one uh, one detail. And then as far as overall um, streaming news, obviously uh, this week there's going to be uh, there's going to be the um, the uh, um, uh, dirty rectangles uh, local game dev meetup. So that is uh, that's something. That normally it was every every third Wednesday. Now it's every second Wednesday, I believe, to accommodate the Toronto group. Um, and uh, I do want to I do want to continue hanging out with them and, and getting uh, giving them the support. It also winds up being something that we can um, <clears throat> every once in a while we find something fun to do on stream. So for instance, that Spring Falls game was a direct result of me uh, seeing some of the, the talent on display at uh, at Dirty Rectangles. So it's definitely something that I am I'm fond of doing and I think it's something that's overall good for the stream. Um, but it does mean that um, it does mean that there's going to be uh, a little bit of a of an interruption, and then next week, uh, next when or sorry, the Wednesday following, um, it is my birthday, so I have not been opposed to streaming on that, um, but especially given the fact that it's you know things are really ramping up at work, and I've really been having trouble sleeping, I may allow myself. Uh, the day to myself. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure on it. I, you know, there's something to be said because my work is at home. You know, streaming does become sort of a way I can interact with people a little bit more. Uh, so there is some value inside of that. But um, just to maybe manage expectations, I know, I don't know if some of the you know the so softness in terms of follow numbers has been a result of um, my more inconsistent starts. But, uh, you know, I wanted to at least do the best that I can in terms of telegraphing uh, when there might be, uh, might be something that's, that's coming up. <clears throat> but uh, I'll, as always, announce stuff on, on Twitter if it comes up. And then finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, I know it's not always fun to have, you know, five to ten minutes of preliminaries. Uh, we are going to be having quite an extended run over in terms of uh, game material in a minute. 
Um, but if you want more Stellaris, um, please leave a comment uh, to that effect, because I know normally I do that sort of stuff at the end of the broadcast, and I think very few people want to wait three hours to hear, eh, you know, is this something you want to keep seeing? We've been really enjoying Age of Wonders Planetfall, but um, it seemed like a good time to get back to um, get back to Stellaris. Obviously, we were given the key for Federations, and uh, I, I have every intention of, I mean, I've certainly given it some good coverage, but I, I certainly want to continue to plumb the depths of, of what this DLC has. Um, it's in fact the only one that's not on sale right now in uh, during the um, during the uh, the Steam sale. Uh, there also was a Paradox sale going on, but I believe that is done. Um, and if you are thinking about getting into Stellaris, one thing that might be of interest to you is the starter pack. So I get a lot of questions in terms of. You know, what DLC do you get to start in the game? Uh, a coworker actually asked me this. <clears throat> and uh, that question has become a lot easier to answer because there is a... In fact, I'll just take a quick minute here. I'm sorry to turn that into like an advertising thing, but I don't get money from Steam, so that's that's a little easier <laughs> easier for me to, to be a bit more genuine on it. Um, so there's a few things here. So there's by uh, Stellaris, by Stellaris Gal Galaxy Edition, by Stellaris Summer Stale Starter Pack, by Stellaris uh, Summer Stale Collection Pack, um, Paradox Grand Strategy Bundle, etc. Um, there's really a little bit of everything in, inside of this. So um, in terms of prices, uh, the lowest discount is 75% off for the Galaxy Edition upgrade pack. Um, but I think there's some, your mileage may vary in terms of, of how interesting you find that sort of stuff. Um, I think it's, like, I'm, I'm rather fond of it. Um, I think there, one, I definitely like having more species. I just happen to like the, you know, the opportunities to pick that sort of stuff up. There's uh, an ebook that's in, included uh, some science fiction short stories, uh, and then Paradox actually does something interesting where you get sort of these um, you get these forum forum icons for buying certain versions of the game, uh, which I think is kind of fun. But I would also point out that it's not actually you could do worse in terms of the Galaxy Edition upgrade pack by virtue of the fact that it costs three sixty two and it includes the soundtrack, whereas. Um, if you buy the soundtrack on its own, that's 50% off, and that costs $3.89. I'm, of course, speaking in Canadian. Uh, so that might be another reason why you're interested in it. Most of the DLC now are 50% off, so that would include everything from the species packs up to uh, Megacorp, I think, is the last big DLC, which is put on a, on a, heavy, um, a heavy discount. Ancient Relics is the most recent sort of story pack with a 50% um, a disc discount. Uh, the Lithoids are now 33% off. This was the species pack that did introduce a new game mechanic in the form of the Lithoid species. And then Federations, of course, was released fairly recently. Uh, and so I think it was back in March. Um, so it's pretty, I, I think it's pretty reasonable that you aren't seeing that uh, as a discount. So um, overall, I would actually say it's not necessarily that bad of a time to get into Stellaris just because the... Uh, the timings in terms of a lot of DLC have made them such that it's um, it's maybe there's a little bit less uh, sticker shock than you'd normally get. Um, some games with a uh, maybe a more rapid um, rapid fire approach to DLC, um, you know, some of the some of the discounts aren't uh, aren't quite as deep, <clears throat> but 50% uh, off for a lot of these things I think is is quite fair. As always, your mileage may vary, and um, I don't know, I'm going to guess Steam is probably the best place for that, but if it just so happens that the prices are similar to Humble, uh, I do have the Humble affiliate link, which you can use if you are so inclined. All right, that's the advertising out of the way. Let's talk about where we were. So I think we're fairly early on in a war, which I didn't start. Um, looks like this was something that we started... Uh, we do have a settled status quo, which is good. Um, <laughs> nope, they were the ones to start it. Okay, so... And they have slightly more war exhaustion than we do, but nothing to write home about. 
So the big challenge with war right now is just what it does to my federation, people's willingness to uh, participate in sort of my uh, particular adventures as opposed to their own. Um, I don't think I have too much to fear from the, uh, from the current war. Um, what I want to manage right now, um, when it comes to my overall influence in terms of my, uh, my federation, you can see that I am very strong. Um, and I'm hoping to get a couple of opportunities to to expand out a bit. So, for instance, one, the Neberites are just ripe for um, uh, for offering subsidiary status, but of course we need to be at peace for that. Um, and then on top of that, um, at some point I'm going to want to join, uh, uh, to go to war with the Cooperative of Manjusana again. That will be coming up in four years. Um, what sort of happened uh, in the last few playthroughs is we got this point where we've now very clearly um, outpaced the Cooperative of Manjusana. And so while I may not necessarily be able to do sort of a, a final kind of death blow, um, what, I've, what I've got now is that I'm able to cripple their infrastructure enough that their their fleets are not necessarily going to be able to handle what I throw at them. And so what I've been slowly doing is sort of slicing away uh, some different um, different parts of their uh, their empire. And um, the the aim the aim here really is going to be to try and push them down to a point where I'm going to be able to um, I'm going to be able to uh, sort of force vassalize them. So uh, offer subsidiary status. So we don't quite count as um, we don't quite count as superior yet. The biggest way that I would be able to do that would be on the economy front. And again, the way that the economy power is determined is basically the resources that you're producing. Uh, if you ever want the specific details, and again, especially if you're getting into Stellaris, this is the best way to learn anything is to go to the wiki. Um, I think I've more or less got these uh, committed to. To memory, I at least sort of know the. I sort of know the ranking, uh, like the ordering of them. But it actually might also be in the. I used to find, have an easier time finding this, um, but <clears throat> I think it goes something to the effect of um, basic resources are going to give you uh, kind of one point each. I think consumer goods are either worth two or two and a half. Uh, alloys are worth more. Alloys are definitely, I've, I've said this a few times, but for me, the real priority in terms of, uh, of um, uh, in terms of uh, a specialized or, or um, advanced goods uh, refined um, would be you want enough consumer goods to have you know to be able to accommodate your growth uh, and every consumer good that you produce above what your sort of internal needs are is waste and it should instead have been going towards alloys now I freaked out a little bit on my consumer goods so I'm definitely falling uh, I'm, I'm failing that rule um, but we should be able to turn that uh, around. Um, and then if, I think you get something, it's something like five or 10. It depends on the, the special resources, uh, but these tend to be worth quite a bit. So basically, the um, when we take a look at the victory, so their economic strength is 15, 7, 8, 7, minus 23, 5, 6, 1. That's actually very surprising. They still count as, um, as equivalent. Um, one of the reasons why I've been attacking them the way that I have is uh, one, I kind of want to add more worlds to my uh, to my territories. Number two, I know that if I go too far to the north, as you can already see, my ally has actually managed to take a few worlds off of um, off of my uh, my um, <clears throat> my war goals. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent happy with the way the claim systems work, but that's life. Um, so what I've kind of been trying to do is take some of the more valuable uh, industrial sites. 
Um, if I could, you know, being able to take stuff like Delphine, um, I think there was also a really good uh, special... Yes, uh, Anachronis. Uh, I really wanted those 10 rare crystals, but it turns out that the Akano sort of snuck that out from, from under me. Um, but part of what I'm trying to do here it has less to do with really whether or not I can sort of defend these borders or whether or not... Um, there's a side that would sort of like me to get a, a border with the Divine Paws Jock State just so I can start feasting on them. Um, but one of the biggest things that I'm focused on right now is to do the most economic damage possible. You know, prioritizing word, worlds that generate um, strategic resources. I mean, that is worthwhile on its own just because that's something that I can get my hands on and use. Um, but also things like, you know, if, if given a choice, you know, I mean, obviously Menjusana is a huge one because it's their capital world. Um, but even if it just comes to sort of uh, idle sectors, you know, um, Stirden uh, over Wistral, um, clearly this is going to be generating more economic power. And taking a system from my opponent here, um, there's the there's the sort of two sides to this particular tactic. One, of course, it's denying them a resource that they, you know, that they can have access to. But more importantly, because specifically what I'm trying to do is to get a, a rating of superior to them, uh, what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to do the maximum possible damage to their economic power while simultaneously increasing my own uh, economic power. <clears throat> so from a management point of view, to be honest, I'd love to just vassalize these guys and never think about them again. Uh, but because I can't do that, I know what I should do uh, to minimize the number of planets that I sort of need to get a grip on. Uh, what I need to be doing is kind of gobbling up the, the most valuable economic targets. Um, and then sort of my second secondary uh, consideration is if I can, uh, being able to get to Redamon would be nice. Uh, although, you know, the border gore as a result is, is certainly going to be a, uh, I think that's going to cause some, some consternation. Um, so, um, if we can, uh, white piece, actually I should talk about why I want a white piece over anything else uh, in, in this uh, conflict, so I'll, I'll move on that in a second. Uh, once the war is done, I want to subjugate uh, the Nebarite Republican territories, just to add them, add them to my, uh, my, um, my power. Of course, uh, it also means that my, um, you know, my, my economic, um, economic power is going to go up by quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as the war is concerned, uh, and then, of course, once uh, these guys are incorporated, then I can go to war with Cooperative and Menjusana to just uh, pick up whatever whatever extra resources I want. Uh, now, when it comes to the White Peace, I am definitely being very selfish about the Federation. I kind of messed up a few details in terms of how I wanted to run things. Um, but I do think that in the long run, we should still be able uh, to get on track in terms of where uh, where we need to go. Um, so we definitely have some cohesion problems right now. I've added some more ambassadors. Uh, as you'll notice here, I, I account for half of the, the envoys. One of the things that I ultimately want to do, um, there is a side of me that considers... Um, the possibility wants to consider the possibility of either kicking out the greatest Wani polity or the Akano citizens alliance uh, one of the things that I sort of want to do when considering considering those details um, so when I take a look at their acceptance you know base minus 50 and Federation minus a thousand uh, we do have reasonably good terms I suspect probably kicking them out is not necessarily going to um, to help matters a similar idea here um, you know, I, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to make sure that uh, that they're out of the Federation before I can sort of absorb them. Um, but particularly the Greatest Wani Polity, that's the thing that's going. Uh, one, I mean, they sort of get in the way of my, you know, my expansion here. Um, but number two, um, the Mandate of Vulu Umu is a a pretty intuitive. Um, that's a pretty intuitive um, uh, sort of uh, expansion option for me. And uh, the fact of the matter is, I don't really have a credible path to uh, to being able to take them. Um, likewise, the Akano Citizens Alliance. Really, I just want these territories. But if if the Akano are are going to be gobbling up whatever parts of the Cooperative of Memjusana, um, I want to get my hands on 
um, it seems that, you know, vassalizing them is the, the next option. Now, one of the reasons why I structured the Federation the way that I did, I kind of wanted to turn them into vassals in an indirect way. So the intention originally was going to be, you know, switch stuff to majority vote, diplomatic vote weight. <clears throat> president uh, decides uh, for, you know, war declarations and invite members and whatnot. Um, basically, the whole idea would be to, um, you know, slowly boil the frog and get the succession term to status change. And of course, the drawback here was I, I, I showed my hand too quickly. And in order to be able to sort of counteract the cooperative of Menjusana, as well as a couple of other elements, I did invite the Raxar entity. Uh, and that sort of threw the balance, um, that sort of threw the balance uh, out in terms of, of being able to manage this, uh, this federation. So I still have some ideas in terms of how I'm going to, I'm going to deal with that, but I need to, I need to direct my attentions towards uh, specific, specific goals in these cases. Um, so that kind of gives us an idea in terms of what the next few turns are going to concern themselves with. I'm still going to be managing my, uh, my sectors through my outliner. I do tend to be a bit twitchy in terms of um, micromanaging things. Um, but uh, really what this should be about is managing the next four years or so um, before we go to war with Cooperative of Manjusana again. Oh yeah, I never really said uh, why I wanted a white piece. In the end, um, because my ability to manipulate the Federation is going to be tied to my economic power, and very specifically to, be have, uh, to have my power um, greater than the sum of my... Uh, my allies. Um, what I really want to have happen is when my allies go to war, I don't want there to be a, um, I really don't want there to be a, uh, um, that much of an, I don't want them to gain uh, all that much. Um, for instance, the Akano gained quite a bit of economic power just by virtue of the fact that they were able to take um, the, uh, the crystals. All right, so uh, Meneth, this was the one where, this is a resort world, so at some point I do need to boost it to sort of the next level. Uh, this means getting a certain level of uh, housing as well as, um, as well as jobs available for people. And really what we're waiting on here, um, let me just take a look at the, I want to see what my construction plans are. Okay, we're actually looking, we're looking all right. So what I think I'm gonna do here, um, I'm gonna set ourselves up. So I need um, crystals for the dome. And then of course I need jobs for people. Oh, so first thing I can do, we'll go from five to seven on housing. So that's gonna give us space for two more jobs. So that'll take care of the next three. And then in terms of available jobs, uh, we can go for some extra commercial zones. So this will take us from five to 10, which of course means that we're gonna need more residences. So at this point, we're kind of, we are sort of struck, stuck a little bit on a treadmill here in terms of constantly generating um, new housing for, uh, for all these workers and whatnot. But the nice thing is, is that these are still, there's sort of like, there's still a net positive that's getting produced out of this. Um, it is a fairly expensive system to maintain, I, I will admit. Like, if you, you can see what the costs here on the planet deficit are. Um, but it does it does have some of these nice little uh, little benefits. Um, oh, actually, why? Oh, that's right, because they're Shapa. So wait a minute, why are these clerks not? Oh, they produce amenities, right. Um, anyways, yeah, I, I'm sort of, I'm, I've decided, I've, I've decided that I will try and push the resort world to the next level, mostly just so I can get rid of that stupid icon. Uh, okay, city district's on its way, so we've already taken care of that. On uh, Delcor Prime, it looks like they want even more housing, so it always makes me sad to have to give up energy. I could actually give up food in this case, too. Um, I think I will replace place the food um the mining world okay so hanteron what was i doing with you i definitely was using them for raw materials um it looks like for some reason i wanted to go very heavy on unity but of course i already know from 
So uh, one wonderful little revelation that we had in terms of my policies was that, oh, not policy, edicts. Um, I can activate every single ambition and uh, I will still be generating positive unity. Uh, so at this point, there's really no reason for me to continue doing that uh, on that world. I mean, there's an argument that I might want to switch out uh, some of these buildings, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll maintain the status quo and I'll think about what I need instead. Um, so our options here, um, I can always get more administrative power. Um, it's not really the most important thing I need right, I need right now. Um, another possibility I suppose I could consider is the fact that our city districts are not that great. Uh, and of course we are running out of the mining districts. Um, another possibility is that we do have the synthetic crystal plants. So there's the idea of building the commerce megaplexes and switching them out into, into other synthetic plants. That actually seems like a better idea, but that doesn't really address the housing shortage. Um, but really the only way I could address the housing... So I can address the housing shortage by building luxury residences, but by building luxury residences, I prevent myself from being able to... Um, I prevent myself from being able to... Uh, um, to employ those people. So... Um, Again, the one possibility I might want to consider here would be to convert one of the hollow theaters into uh, luxury residences here uh, and then upgrade them to the higher level dome. Uh, that'll help me out in terms of some, um, some of my housing issues. Um, yeah, actually, that sounds, that sounds like a really good idea. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Um, let's take the com uh, commercial zone. We'll replace you and build some luxury condos. It's pretty clear I don't have a clear... I, I, I've got, I don't really have any strong ideas about what to do with this planet yet. I, I wanted it to be a strong mining planet, but obviously we also need housing as well. So I'm finding a new balance on that world. Now as weary, as weary I really took so I could have it. Um, we are short on jobs, which says to me, really, at this point, we need the Commerce Megaplex, and then we go back on the... We go back on our, our priority of, um, of building refining capacity. I mean, the nice thing about it is the more trade I have, I get commercial uh, consumer goods as a result of that anyways. <laughs> Okay, moving right along, we've got Gagush. So this was one of the the worlds that we conquered from our um, our neighbors to the north. This is a difficult one because it's looking for specialist employment. Um, in fact, in this case, I think we basically have everything we need. Um, <clears throat> I suppose. Oh yeah, we're already building it. Okay, yeah. So unless uh, unless I want to upgrade the hyper entertainment uh, forum, and in that case, I'd probably want to switch it to some other type of of building at this point. If I'm completely honest, um, we're good. I think really at this point we just need those four extra pops, and then. Um, then we can deal with our housing problems. Actually, what is the housing capacity difference? Nine to thirteen. So that gives us another four pops, but we're st so we're short two. So I do actually need to find another. Um, I do need another city district. We'll switch that out now. All right, and then uh, when I can, I will be switching the. I'll be switching the. Um, or upgrading all of my star bases and whatnot, but as you can see, I was already working on that with alloys, so this is going to take a while. Uh, as far as the construction ships are concerned, I don't think there's anything for them to do. Um, I suppose the best I could do would be to get them at a base so that they're not wasting resources. And this science ship... I built a new one, but I wasn't clear why. Mm -hmm. 
I could have also bought one from the curators, but I'll save the money. Okay. So, yeah, this is actually the drawback about going away for the time that I did. Um, there is something to be said for... I mean, it could be that I wanted to look at the... No, that doesn't make sense. Um, they're all assisting research. Well, um, I did say I was eventually going to do the horizon mm -hmm. signal, so let's, uh, let's start with that. Construction completed. Uh, incoming transmission. Brigands blockade at Julau. Representatives of Jomar Limited. A temporary blockade is now in effect in Julau. Processing and transportation of food and minerals through the system are now subject to seizure by external customs and acquisitions officers of the Bermet Thassilocracy. All non-merchant vessels will be turned away or else fired upon. These conditions shall remain in effect until our ECA quotas can be met. Um, sometimes these customs checks can be stressful. We understand, uh, cooperate, and no one needs to be harmed. And please, rest assured that every grain and ore that we solemnly claim will be put to good use within the Bimat Ecohub propagation scheme. Uh, scheme. We are grateful for your consideration for a brighter, self-made future. Who are these people and why are they allowed to do that? <laughs> I've actually never encountered this before. So, bold move, uh, Bimadai. Foolish, but bold. Now, I don't actually have that much to worry about from them. Um, armed yachts. Nice. Um, I can... Hmm. So this is the, the dilemma that I, I face right now, is that uh, I definitely don't want to get involved in my allies' war. I don't want to... Um... I do have to say, uh, Malator, do you normally start off uh, your, your chats this way? I have no idea what you're talking about in terms of awkward color choices, but that seems to be uh, not the friendliest way to introduce yourself to a stream. Um... The, uh, yeah, so I could, I mean, I, I don't exactly have a shortage of fleet strength. Uh, the question is whether or not I really want to redirect these forces because it's one of the longest journeys that I could possibly take. Also, just very curious who these guys are. Research concluded. All right, nerve dampeners five. Careful tuning of pain receptors allows soldiers to fight through what would previously have been debilitating injuries. So bonus to army health, probably the least exciting of the upgrades I can get. But as always, we go for the uh, the cheaper options. So aggressive conditioning number five. Um, 
And you know what? I think what I'm going to do, uh, if I have any fleets that haven't been upgraded yet, I will send them to deal with the pests. Uh, but no, it looks like everybody's upgrading. So at this point, I'm just going to sit on my, uh, I'm going to sit on my hands and wait for that to finish. So let's think about what my station upgrade. Okay, every all the stations have already upgraded. I do have a free one. Um, a special project has completed. Given my preference, I'd probably like to build it on a on a planet that's got a lot of trade. So maybe be able to take something from Azwiri. Um, or Howard, for that matter. All right. The Horizon Signal, Gravity is Desire. Science Officer Bakugath reports that the signal was unexpectedly easy to decipher, but their team had spent considerable time confirming that it's not a hoax. It is repeating half cohere uh, It is a repeating half-coherent message in the Jomaran language, something like a poem. It repeats the phrase, phrases Gravity is Desire and Time is Sight. It encodes coordinates near the black hole, and it ends with a dedication by name to the science officer. Uh, blank, who adds dispassionately that they have confirmed that the signal has been radiating into interstellar space since before their birth. In fact, the signal may predate our civilization. Fascinating. Send the vessel to those coordinates. Situation log has been updated. The horizon signal, the worm. As the ISS uh, Mulgrish 7 approaches the coordinate specified by the signal, it begins to report spatial distortions and curious lensing effects. A rich stream of valuable data, and then, uh, then the transmission becomes distorted. What happens next is analyzed exhaustively. The excitement in science officer uh, uh, Bakugeth's voice tautens to fear as the ship's hull struggles against increasingly exotic conditions. As the trip ship triggers a distress call, uh, Bakugeth cries out, The worm! Or perhaps, The worm. Then all transmissions end. No trace of the ISS uh, Mulgrish 7 is ever found. No further transmissions, no debris, and the space at those coordinates is innocuous and utterly free of distortions. But the data that they sent back has advanced our physics research dramatically. Perhaps it was worth their lives. We learn and we go on. Okay, so we knew that was coming. Um, oh yeah, I guess this invites the question, like, uh, I, I did sort of have a spare science ship kicking around for really no reason. Do I want to get another? Um, and actually, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, unfortunately, all of my stations seem to be occupied, so... Sorry, guys, just want to take a quick second to check something here. Cool. Okay, Bleg has got a free... Sorry this is so slow, by the way. There's a side of me that just kind of wanted to put this up on high speed and and run along, but I did say I was going to do the horizon signal, so... Um, the real question here is whether or not I want to pursue more alloys or not. I, it's hard for me to say I need fewer alloys. I think I'm I'm actually quite far behind in terms of where I want to be. That also includes fleets. Um, I don't know how well we will handle an endgame event if it comes down to it. Alright, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't... Um... Research concluded. I'm kind of glad I didn't come after them because it looks like they're coming after... It looks like they're coming after the uh, Fallen Empires, so they're going to get a lesson in humility. Synapse Interceptors 4, increasing the speed at which interstellar fighters uh, can... Sorry. Increasing the speed at which fighter pilots can process and act upon enemy positioning data, elevates strike craft up a few steps... Sorry. Cry, elevates strike craft a few steps up the food chain. More damage from the craft. Um, we actually get an option here, so... Um... My inclination is definitely to go towards more aggressive choices, so this would be for kinetic or explosive damage. And to be honest, I actually don't know. I kind of failed my my goal in letting the 
um, or trying to make more decisions for myself in terms of my um, in terms of my uh, ships. So the Titan is explosive oriented. I will admit, one thing I'm a little surprised by, I put a lot of effort into energy weapons thinking that my battleship um, had uh, had the, um, the Tachyon Lance, but that doesn't actually seem to be the case. So in terms of the actual breakdown of my damage, um, my, my real, like, flagships, uh, speaking of, I need to make sure I'm building a Titan, um, you know, my flagships are all explosives. Um, it does seem that there is a very heavy kinetic component on just about every other ship. Um, so my inclination would probably be towards kinetic at this point. Um, missile boat doesn't really decide one way or the other because it's got both. Yeah, okay. Let's... Um, Let's focus on our kinetic weapons for the time being. I do want to see these guys get blown up. Um, I think these are a group that I actually want to be on. Wow, that was quick. Uh, Surveyor activated. We have swept our space with a strong scanning beam on the Surveyor Relic, and a previously unknown resource deposit has been identified on XXN2340. So that was my artifact activating. That's actually a time for my uh, construction ship to, uh, to get to work. If I was thinking, I would have highlighted it, but I wasn't, so now I have to search for it individually. Unless, of course, it's already part... Yeah, it looks like it's already already there. All right, Takvan, what do you got for me? You got two jobs at the moment. Um, Ship upgrades applied. So my inclination is, the key is to, the universe. to... I think probably in this case... Well, one, I'm going to upgrade the energy building for sure. Um, next, I need to give them commercial zones. And we're going to be doing the same pattern that we've done uh, before. So... Um, we're sort of at a point now where if you're not producing alloys, you really need to be producing um, specialized uh, strategic resources. Okay, Storm got an up or Stream got an upgrade, um, but it looks like it's they're waiting for the next uh, the next batch. So uh, I will go to Mavel and prepare a new science ship. Again, it's hard for me to say why I exactly need this. I could put them at the top, too. They don't take that long to make. Um, this is really just... I had a number before, and I'm restoring it. Uh, there's really no no major justification. Uh, focusing arrays 10 energy weapon damage plus 5%. Perfecting the firing cadence of our laser weaponry is a task that could keep the engineers and engineering elite of any given planet busy for centuries. Um, so my usual inclination would be to go for the extra focusing arrays or coolant, um, but uh, I think in this case here, uh, I would have done extra energy credits. It's always nice to have more energy, but um, shield hit points is about survivability, and we know we'll be going to a war sooner rather than later. Um, and again, I do need to decide. At some point, I, I really do need to um, figure out what I'm doing with these remaining slots. Okay, Divine Pause Ship Jump State have declared the Neverite. Ship upgrades applied. These have to be... Okay, actually not all of them are. We're good there. Uh, this place apparently needs more. Whether or not these are particularly effective uses of my um, my alloys, I really don't know. Um, there is one other thing I want to take a look at, which is, am I building a Titan yet? If I'm not, that's a huge oversight that I need to correct immediately.
No, then again, that also makes sense because if I had the money for a Titan, yeah. So... No, it's Mavel that's got the Titan shipyards. All right, so that's a very high priority. This is going to take a while to build, um, but it's hard to hard to turn down the opportunity. Ship upgrades applied. Ship right. upgrades applied. These I'm fine with. Ship upgrades applied. Ship upgrades applied. Again, this isn't exactly like this isn't gonna ship upgrades applied completely move the needle ship upgrades um, applied and at some point i do need to i need to get a little more consistent with my um construction completed uh with a number of defensive platforms and building applied. and whatnot but that's definitely a i've i've ship taken care of everything applied. else um kind of an upgrade rather than a, ship upgrades applied okay i probably got that one wrong Ship upgrades applied. Ship upgrades applied. Ship upgrades applied. I wonder if this is putting me in an eternal loop. Ship upgrades applied. I think I'm going to let these sit for Ship a bit. Ship upgrades applied. Ship upgrades applied. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think I know what's happening here. It's saying it every single time one of the defensive platforms gets updated. That's probably going to be a completed. little annoying. Ship upgrades applied. All right. These guys finished their construction queue. I think that might have been my... Um... Ship upgrades applied. Research concluded. Yeah, that was the science ship. Again, I don't exactly have a clear idea about what I want to do with this yet, but one thing I can always, uh, one thing that I can do for myself is just attach them to another, another science-oriented world. Um, and in fact, there's a side of me that wants to invest very heavily. I don't, either I have a very high cap in terms of my leaders, or they've sort of changed the rules of that. Um, but honestly, at this point, I could probably afford to have a lot more scientists giving some bonuses uh, to my planets. One thing that's a little odd about my circumstances are that the Raxar entity, I think, has a... Oh, no, they don't have it anymore. They used to have a fairly substantial technological lead over me, uh, which was a small source of concern um, if I planned on betraying them. But... All right, we've got our aggressive conditioning. Iterating on the standard conditioning regimen for ground troops has proven to make them more effective in direct combat. So let's say the administrative cap wouldn't be terrible. Uh, although again, like 15 isn't exactly the sort of number that makes me get um, giddy. Uh, edict duration is kind of nice. Although like we said, the extra we have more unity than it's ever going to cost us to... Um, uh, to to enable those edicts. Um, still doing it because I can save myself the money for the ones that aren't uh, that aren't unity based. All right, science ship. So here's what I think I'm going to do with this guy. So right now we've got one at Wolaeus Prime, Cador, Naval. Mescaban, Ghidra. I'm almost certainly not going to remember that. Um, I don't think the planet log quite tells me the details that I need. I don't think the expansion planner is going to help me with that. No. Um, so probably the best for me to start off with is... Okay, so I've got Ghidra... Vanico, okay, Vanico is 6, not 6k. So Yidra Secundus and Mescaban, we already knew that those were getting upgrades, so we're good there. That The majority of the science research is coming from those worlds. Um, next up, Mavel. I think Mavel itself is the source of all of this science. Oh no, it's Wolaeus, but again, both Mavel and Wolaeus have been um, accounted for, so that's good. Cador, uh, I think it's just the one planet. Yeah, Cador Prime, which has a science ship surrounding it. 
So, Gag Such. Now that one, we probably don't have a science ship around, so... That seems to be the right call. And, I mean, one of the things I might want to consider in the future is um, when it comes to situations like this, I might I might establish a threshold, even something as simple as saying, like, at 1k, uh, you get a dedicated assist research um, ship. Because, obviously, a 10% bonus to a, a 1k... You know, a 1k research planet, that's not nothing. Ship upgrades applied. Alright, uh, construction ship. Oh, this is one of the ones that doesn't, uh, doesn't house ships. Ship upgrades applied. I think at this point I'm just going to keep them in place. All right, we've got a corporate building now. I changed applied. my priority. So coming back to what I was saying before, uh, if you look at my actual production, I, I have not been following this rule. Um, but the general idea that if you are, um, if you are, uh, if you're if you're building surplus consumer goods. Um, you are missing the opportunity to build alloys, which are both a better source of economic strength and are ultimately uh, better ways. You, you can do more with them, right? Um, if you run a small deficit of consumer goods, uh, but a large surplus of alloys, then you can just go and take the consumer goods your neighbors have. Um, a surplus of 500 is a bit ridiculous, especially given that I'm, I'm sitting on 37,000, but it's what I've got right now. So what I used to be doing was uh, virtual entertainment studios, and those were really focused around the fact that I was able to use uh, planet slots to uh, to get alloy forges, and then um, the you know the consumer goods would sort of be handled off world by other people's uh, other people's planets. Now at the moment I don't I don't need that. Um, there are other there are other things for me to to be focusing on right now. So. Um, you know, I'm still looking for labor, probably less than I was before. So Xeno Outreach Agency might make sense. Uh, there's not really a sense for me doing a public uh, relations firm anymore because we've got more unity than we need. If I have to, private research enterprises, although honestly, six is a drop in the bucket in most of these cases. Um, private military industries, if I really want to, you know, to say, okay, it's, you know, it's really important for us that we... Um, we maximize the number of alloys, but honestly, like two energy to get three alloys, we can definitely do better. Um, there is a, a small interest in something like a mercenary liaison office because that w that winds up being a sneaky way that I can start boosting my naval capacity. Um, the executive retreat is also kind of interesting because of the idea of the higher amenities, although I'm willing to guess that most of my worlds don't actually have amenities problems. They have housing problems. Um, corporate embassy is another big one. Um, again, just because of the, the bonuses towards diplomatic weight from economy. Um, and then I guess for the really expensive uh, branch offices, I can see myself doing a commercial forum. So yeah, I suppose the big question now would be, do I... Do I go for the... Uh, not the executive retreat. Do I go for the corporate embassy? Um, actually, I want to get a little more detail on this. Because I haven't used them. Well, I haven't used them as much as I should. Uh, did I misspell that? Nope. That's not what I was looking for. Probably reading the index would be helpful here. Um, uh, 
There we go. Unfortunately, it looks like it might just be telling me the same... Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't really tell me something that I didn't already get from the... All right, well, you know what? Let's just keep building corporate emb embassies. That's my highest priority right now. The other things aren't exciting enough for me to throw, uh, throw away the possibility of achieving my diplomatic goals uh, through branch offices. So moving right along, we've got a worker shortfall. Oh, of course, because I got rid of the the hollow theater um how am i doing for my gas probably not good yeah i can't afford to throw away gas just for those jobs so that is unfortunate and i will reconsider uh future shifts like that but that's that's just life these guys on the other hand this is a bummer um I need three more jobs. Honestly, at this point, just upgrading the commercial forum. No, no need to make that complicated. And then Garam. I think Garam, we're back in a state where we're not 100% sure what we want to do with these planets yet. So let's say for them, I have three jobs. I need two more. So we will take advantage of another refinery. Uh, in this situation here, I feel like exotic gas is what we what we could benefit the most from. Uh, and then I'm actually going to build uh, energy. So I seem to go down the farming route again. I think it's because I freaked out a little bit about my overall food consumption. But that should, uh, as long as I keep a close enough eye on it, we should be okay. Um, this is really bad. I definitely should have had more space. Ah, now actually this is an interesting one. Um, we're totally maxed out. Um, but there isn't really a reason for me to have an administrative park here anymore. And in fact, the business management nexus is also suspect. Um, okay, well, this the housing problem's not gonna solve itself. Um, I am always very uncertain about getting rid of uh, administrative buildings because I have a feeling that that's going to come back to bite me um, before too long. Um, but let's get... I mean, Cador, Cador has every possible benefit for uh, science. So at this point, any building that's not science-oriented probably needs to go. Um, and in fact... Uh, this is a little more delicate because it does generate the amenities. I think in this case, I'm actually willing to give them the, the upgrade. All right, Yidra Secundus. Um, similar depressing state of affairs. Um, we don't quite have the housing capacity that we need, so we'll switch them to a city district. Mescaban has got uh, unemployment problems. However, when the Arcology project finishes, that shouldn't be a problem anymore. I do need to find a place for these guys to go, though. So let's... Um, We'll ship them off where we can. Uh, Ratamario, I think, is in a similar case. So, in one sense, I could do the upgrade to the the business management nexus. That would give well, it gives three jobs. Yeah, I don't feel great about that, but um, we're still not getting rid of the robot assembly plants just because. How do you feel using in-game browsers in this one, security-wise? I don't feel too bad about it. Um, the, uh, I mean, in the end, like, I suppose the question would be, like, what, what really am I going to get, um, like, what am I going to get really hammered with? Um, I don't, I don't really feel in, like, I guess if, if, if I, if I, if security was, like, first in mind as far as, as far as this particular like computer and this setup was concerned. I probably would be doing a, a few other steps before I would be looking at my um, at using the, the in-game browser. I mean, if you don't want to use it, um, there 
if you're playing on Steam, you obviously have the the web browser built inside of it. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you have a second monitor, uh, obviously you can you can go into your other other tab. Um, but I don't know. In my case here, it's just nice, especially for the purposes of broadcasting. Um, if I go into another window and I say, okay, I'm typing in these words and, and going into this this article, um, that's not really all that helpful. Um, if, on the other hand, I bring up, you know, the Stellaris wiki and you can see exactly what I'm looking at, that's just a little bit more tangible. And more importantly, it's a little bit like when I decide to um, right-click certain... Uh, certain movement decisions. Um, it's not necessarily that I prefer to to manually click every menu option, but it definitely winds up uh, it winds up being something that I think if somebody has a stream muted or if they're otherwise not like a hundred percent focused on what's going on, it's still something that they're going to be able to sort of register uh, what was going on. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of tutorials uh, make this mistake, like for uh, certain programs, people are so used to using hotkeys. Um, some of the better ones do put a tracker in terms of what those hotkeys are. Um, but generally, the the person stops focusing on the fact that they're, you know, what they're doing is showing a game or showing a program to somebody who doesn't necessarily know those concepts, that they're there to learn them. And as a result, it uh, it sometimes makes the... Uh, I think it makes the, the presentation a little bit weaker. So in this case, where I can explicitly show something on the on the broadcast, I, I opt, opt into doing that. You absolutely got destroyed um, in a new playthrough of Stellaris, and now you're going to let it marinate for another five months. <laughs> really? Um, I always See, actually, this is, this is one of the reasons why I, I really like watching No Virtue um, play Stellaris, because No Virtue is very good at the game. Um, and is, is like... Not not just very good at the game, but like um, streams at the like the the kind of the appeal of watching them is to to sort of see high level Stellaris play, and I think one of the things that really got my attention uh, in terms of her broadcasts was the fact that once I was sort of really paying attention, I realized that she doesn't win every game that she plays. Um, she will sometimes have very difficult starts and they're ones that she's not able to overcome the sort of the, the drawbacks that, um, that she first encountered. Um, and I think that's, uh, to me at least, that's a, that's always interesting because of course, whenever you see someone who's better at a game than you um, run into to maybe difficulties that you find familiar, um, I you know I, I like those things just because they you know they help me relate to them. Um, but number two, I also think that it communicates sort of a willingness to experiment. Like you never really get better at something if you're uh, if you're not willing to have the risk of, of failing at it. So you know, I've read a lot of math texts. Um, and I've definitely done the opening chapters of a lot of math textbooks, and I've done all of the problems in the opening chapters of math textbooks. Um, I have compu uh, completed fewer, um, and definitely in those cases, I, uh, yeah, I'm not as strong in the subjects on, on those uh, books that I read. Um, on the other hand, obviously you play games for enjoyment, so if... Uh, you know, a feeling like you just get creamed every time you jump into something. Um, you know, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily lend itself Shift to the most relaxing applied. Uh, gaming experience. So I can I can sort of understand how there's a, upgrades bit, applied. a bit of a balance Knowledge that needs to be struck. To the universe. Um, it's actually one problem I have with multiplayer, which is that I have some games that I really love and I like being able to share them with people. But uh, one of the challenges that comes out of it is because I love that game so much and I'm trying to introduce a friend to it, oftentimes multiplayer options are not going to be cooperative. They're, they're generally competitive. And so like a perfect example of this would be Twilight Struggle. I think Twilight Struggle is a really interesting game and I'm not particularly good at it. Um, I would really like to study and understand that game a lot more than I do. but. It, um, it's not the simplest game. Like, I would argue that if you don't want to, like, 
If you think you're just going to play Twilight Struggle once, it's probably not worth trying to learn it. Um, you kind of need to... It's like a, a paradox game. Like, by getting the game, you're sort of signing on to something that's a bit more demanding of your time than what you might expect for another game. Um, but of course, the drawback with something like Twilight Struggle, it, in some senses, it's all maybe even a little bit like chess. Um, you can't help knowing the game better than your opponent. And if it's a you know reasonably well-balanced game, or it's one that sort of relies on understanding some of the nuances, um, it's going to be a situation where you know you can't really help. Like you can you can definitely do some things to sort of balance it out for your opponent, but. For a certain while, while somebody's learning, they're going to have that difficulty of uh, facing off against someone who is quite a bit stronger than they are. Uh, one way that I think Stellaris gets around this rather nicely is, of course, you do not need to be rivalrous when you play with someone else. You could do a cooperative approach. Um, that's not possible in Twilight Struggle, which is a two-player game. And so if there is a... If there's a difference between the two players, then you need to quantify that difference in terms of, you know, a number of influence tokens, let's say. Uh, but even then, that disadvantage can be erased very quickly for someone who's just learning how the cards work. Um, and so this is actually a challenge that I face. Like, I remember, I'm not going to say who it was, um, but it's someone who I've, I actually have really enjoyed playing this game with in the past, but they've been away for a while. Um, and there's this great game called Chaos Reborn, which has this nice little element of probability in it. And one of the things that I do rely on in that game sometimes is making an opponent feel helpless um, because it tends to make them make mistakes. The big thing about Chaos Reborn is it's like chess in the sense that if you capture the king, it doesn't matter that all of your other pieces were, you know, were lost. Um, you know, you, st you were still able to, to bring the game home. You were able to capture your opponent. Um, but, uh, I think it lasted like three rounds and I had, I mean, I might be, I, I don't know if the person I was playing with is, is watching the stream, so I might be giving it away, but what I'd done to create this sense of hopelessness for my opponent was I used what's called an illusion. So in this game, you have a probability of successfully casting a spell. The more powerful spells also have lower probabilities of being cast. You have a disbelieve mechanic, but if you disbelieve something that actually is real, then you are not able to cast a spell on your own. So if your opponent has a lot of creatures on the table and you don't, and you use your disbelieve on something that's actually real, uh, that's another turn where you're falling behind in terms of things that can potentially take you out. So what I had done was I had actually, I had three creatures on the table. Two of them were illusions. Um, and uh, what my opponent did was they tried to do, it's a subversion, so it, you know, turns an enemy creature into an ally. What was really interesting on that one is had it switched uh, teams, it would have been revealed to be an illusion, and chances are he would have known to, like, you know, to pop my other, my other creatures. Um, but in their case, the subversion didn't work. Um, it, it failed uh, on, it, the cast was successful, but the the um, the die roll to see whether or not the creature would be would be subverted uh, failed, and so it created this impression for them where like everything was going well for me, everything was going wrong for them, and they surrendered. And like, yes, I want to win. I I'm not gonna pull punches because it's you know a friend and I want to you know play play more games. I think that's kind of not a that's not a good way because people aren't going to get better. Um, but it does create this problem, right? Where if, you know, something that might be an optimal strategy for the game might create an impression where somebody doesn't want to play the game anymore. Um, and that's uh, that's not not so great. So anyways, that's my really long answer to, to what you're you're going on, uh, Miles 4K. I do encourage you to get back on that horse um, and maybe even just adjust some of the settings uh, if you feel like you, you were put up against an unfair... Uh, an unfair uh, opponent, but um, I'll always encourage people to play Stellaris. All right, so we got our connect kinetic weapon damage, uh, ultra dense slugs that can punch through even the strongest of projected shields. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I make a lot of stupid. This is actually one of the reasons when I play a new paradox game, I don't play on Iron Man. When I play on stream, I tend to do Iron Man. God, it's really tempting. You know what? I'm going to double down on the kinetic weapons here for the attack speed. 
Um, I play on Iron Man on stream because in the end, reloading doesn't always... For Stellaris, at least, it really breaks the flow. Um, Age of Wonders Planetfall, obviously it doesn't. But um, for a lot of stuff that I play, um, I do it Iron Man just because it's on broadcast. But I'll, I 100% learn Stellaris on uh, on the, the main one. Also, I'm sorry, I know there's only a few people in here right now, and uh, it's been slow. It's been slow to make some progress, um, but I need to make a quick trip to the bathroom again in less than a minute, hopefully. Um, but I'll get that out of the way right now, and um, we'll, we'll be on our way to sort of flying through the rest of the stream. So um, see you guys in a second. My god, the viewer count doubled while I was on the bathroom. By the way, I live in perpetual fear that um, when I step away for a bathroom break like that, what you like, I'm going to mute the mute the music and keep the mic on. So you'll hear like footsteps going away and then like a flush and then a hand like the, the sink. Um, so far, that hasn't happened. There, there was one time when uh, I had the bathroom like quite literally. It, it's a weird. It was. I, it was. The acoustics were a little weird, but like, um, the bathroom was a lot closer to the uh, to the mic. This was back when I lived in Vancouver, uh, and I, I did make that mistake once. But terrible secret. Of being, yeah. Um, I mean, part of it is just because of the. I, I, I've noticed the bathroom breaks have been like increasing a lot on the stream, but also, hello, Erasmus. Um, but uh, I think one of the things is because I've been struggling with sleep so much, uh, one of the really bad habits I've been falling into is just drinking a lot more coffee to compensate. Um, and I mean, that has all sorts of con consequences, but one of which is the frequency of bathroom breaks is, has kind of gone up. Um, I need to find a better answer for that, but will not, uh, that won't be addressed today. All right, so I should have done this sooner, um, but what I think I'm going to do in terms of extra star bases, uh, I am going to start. So the main reason why I want the star bases is just so I can boost my naval capacity. Um, but not all star bases are, are built equally. Um, there's definitely something to be said for getting some more defensive positions down, but we're not, I'm not that scared. And to be honest, like maybe I'll wait for my 
conquest of the cooperative of Menjusana before I start um, building new new breakpoints. Because like Murist, obviously, like this is a pretty hardcore base, um, and it really doesn't serve a purpose anymore. Um, there's like if I'm really scared of somebody coming in from this angle. This is not the defensive structure I want. The defensive structure I want is in the black hole uh, because not only, like, there's the L gate there, right? Like, they're going to be able to get wherever they want. If you don't mind me asking what year did you set as the baseline for the, uh, just whatever the default settings are. So I'm assuming that it should be coming at any any year now. Um, I've actually not experienced too many end game crises um, simply because um, in the old system, um, or like the, in the like the, the for the old game we'd usually win before uh, before the end game crisis came in so I it's gonna be fun uh, I hope um, to to finally encounter some some things I haven't uh, haven't seen in the game yet which is weird because it's not like they've added new crises it's just I've been there, there's actually a, a small handful of stuff that keeps coming up that I've I've gotten as opposed to um, having having experienced all of them all right they Ship want to increase the apply. size of the council hell no i want to decrease the size of anything ship upgrades i didn't even realize applied. we could change that Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've I, one of the Ship upgrades applied. The re, one of the reasons I am so focused on trying to get the uh, naval capacity up is because, you know, right now I've been bullying my neighbors, and I very specifically have been keeping my allies weaker than what they would normally be. Um, but the consequence to that, and I think this is one of the reasons why the end game crises are. You know, are the Ship way that they are. Um, is that if you play that way, if you play, you know, as the very selfish hyperpower, um, then the fact of the matter is, you know, it's going to be on you to overcome that challenge. Uh, and especially with the changes brought into Apocalypse, um, you know, you can't necessarily be everywhere, and it it can it can have some pretty serious consequences in terms of your ability to to stop the. Uh, stop the crisis. Um, no bling to sell, so at this point, let's just... Oh, I'm really not getting much of a return on that. We'll sell them in 5,000 chunks. That said, if we get to 2,500 and no endgame crisis, I'm, I'm happy. But there's a reason why we still have a... Why we've kept one of our Ascension perks uh, open. Uh, I want to see what we're up against. Knowledge is the key to the universe. All right, the basic mechanics of ship shields are complex, but they can be adjusted and improved in mul a multitude of ways. So here I'm thinking, well, we have to, I said I was going to go for the cheapest option each time, so... There it is. Uh, the black hole in the black hole in Faranus black hole is active again. Once again, the looping signal flickers in the darkness at the edge of normal space. By this time, there's an acoustic message encoded in the signal. It sounds very, uh, very like uh, Bakugeth's voice. What was shall be, Bakugeth intones. What shall be was. Then the same coordinates as the first signal. Uh, the coordinates where Bakugeth was lost. Uh, what the media has christened the exit point, and they say a name: Pashna Sutar. So, if you have never experienced this, I highly recommend going down this path. This was added in the Leviathans, uh, the patch that was associated with the Leviathans, the Kennedy patch, uh, named after um, the, the author of the Horizon Signal. Um, but I have done this more than a few times, and I know it's going to happen, so... Ah, damn it, they're going to take one of my... All right, well... Pashna Sutar volunteers to go. Permit it. You know, uh, when it comes to the saving the slot, I, you know, I wish I had a better, 
I wish I had a better analysis of the, you know, the, the costs and benefits. Um, in my own experience, uh, we've sumped the space for the strong, with a sc strong scanning beam and an unknown, wait, a previously unknown resource deposit has been identified. All right, that gives my construction chips. Um, the biggest thing for me is that I have never really been able to articulate a situation in which you are paying too much uh, by leaving that option open. Um, I think it is a fun, like it, the system seems to be working as intended. There is something to be said for committing to a choice. Actually, I kind of wish more games would do this. Um, you know, committing to a choice um, should be something that more games kind of make you do. Um, but yeah, like to, to be able to turn around and say, you know, in, in this one, it's like, okay, you decided to go down this path. Yes, I'm sorry your opponents did something that's a hard counter to that, but this, you know, this is how your species has developed. Um, and you, you can't just sort of turn on a dime. Um, another game that I think does this really well is Offworld Trading Company. So you have lots of different strategies you can employ in terms of how you're, you know, how you're going to achieve your goal. Like in the end, you want to make a lot of money and you want to buy out your competitors. How you make that money is very much a question of your read of not just the map, but specifically a read of what your opponents are up to. You know, what do you think they're going to pursue? What benefits do they have? Um, who's taken what resources? Um, I think it can be perfectly viable to keep with raw materials um, in that game and, uh, you know, and, and come out on top. But um, if, you, if you do that, you need to allow for the possibility that people wind up dumping those raw materials and your prices kind of go, you know, go through the floor. Um, and then you're not, you know, you're, you're, there's a limited number of contracts that you can get. Like, it's, it's not like you can sort of st st kind of turn your, your entire enterprise around. Um, and I mean, look, you lose games because of that. Um, and I think that's totally fine. Um, it's, it's why... You know, it's why games like that are fun and interesting to play. Um, but I do know that there's definitely a tendency. This is not to be some sort of like stupid PC master race or, or like, you know, get good kind of gamer opinion. It, it's really it's really a question of taste. But I do tend to notice that a lot, of, especially the games that have reputations for being difficult, um, actually baby their players quite a bit. Um, you know, if you think about first-person shooters since Halo, um, there is this idea that you don't go hunting for health packs anymore. Um, you hide behind a wall and your health regenerates. And that that's a really good idea, and that keeps the action going. Uh, Doom did a really interesting way of handling that, which was they rewarded you with more health for doing cool kills. Uh, so in that case, that's aligning the incentives of making sure that you're being very active um, while while still trying to like make sure that you you know you have an interesting game to play, um, but even a game like Dark Souls, like Dark Souls, gives you an infinite number of times to try and beat its challenges. Um, you know, Darkest Dungeon, which has a you know unless you play on the Stygian mode, um, you will have an infinite amount of time and an endless stream of of recruits to take on the dungeon. The the combat might be. Um, quite brutal, but the game itself is actually very hard to lose. Um, and uh, I'll admit, I, I think it's because this is what gamers want. I actually think, by and large, gamers don't like to lose games. I don't feel good when I lose games, but uh, I do like to have a challenge. And so I, I think I tend to respect games like um, Stellaris and Offworld Trading Company uh, that do say, you know, you, you've made a decision and this is the decision that you've like this is the decision you've committed to for this playthrough we are not going to we're not going to bail you out of this one um it's nice to sort of have those consequences um that's not just for story games and uh i think that's kind of why i like the tradition system but what it does wind up doing because there are these consequences again it's a it's a statement of how successful this this system is uh, if you know you have one last slot and you don't know what the end game event is going to be, um, you're not going to take advantage of that ascension perk. And so I think if they wanted to get past the idea, or like if they considered the eighth ascension perk 
to be a problem, uh, that it's something that people should be using as soon as it becomes available. Uh, I think what they would need to do is they would need to come up with some sort of a way of making it a an interesting sort of um, sort of a, a a risk assessment. So it's like I'm not going to get a bonus um, against the fallen empires or whatever, um, but that's fine because the gains that I'm making from this uh, are so great that I'm going. They are equivalent to having a, a custom tailored uh, advantage against the end game event. Um, and it's, you know, it's an open question as to whether or not it is actually a problem that people aren't using that last slot. I kind of think it is in some wow. cases just because I, I tend to feel that um, hoarding is generally not a good thing. Like you guys have seen my Morrowind playthroughs. I still have potions from like the beginning of the game, which I'm just yeah I'm just waiting for the right moment, right? And traditions have kind of become that in in Stellaris, but it, like it doesn't ruin my enjoyment in the game. Anyways, uh, the Horizon Signal, I'm through. This time the ship is running fully automated. Pashna Sutar is the only crew member aboard. As it approaches the exit point, the telemetry stream fills up with fascinating data. Once again, space flexes, gravity uncoils. Pashna Sutar reads off the headline data, echoing the telemetry. They are commendably calm. We've sent a professional. It takes a little while for anyone to realize something is peculiar about the timing. Pashna Sutar is no longer echoing the data. They're predicting it. The telemetry disagrees, but only for a few seconds until it catches up. The monitoring team is reporting that the prediction interval is increasing when Pashna Sutar says wonderingly, I'm through. It's dark, they add. That's not a problem. We can live in the dark. I never thought of that. But of course, we can live here forever, if the worm will only wait. At that moment, the signal cuts out, and the ship disappears from our team's sensors. This is horrible. This is regrettable. This is fascinating. Um, ship I, upgrades applied. I do kind of plan to get to the end of this, so for those of you who want to keep the finale of the uh the horizon signal um ship upgrades applied to them you know to to their first experience i will try and i will try and delineate uh when um you know when the when the ending is coming up i think from context it's kind of obvious Construction uh, when when you're you're kind of hitting the point of no return um but uh you know, fair, uh, fair warning. Like it, I am gonna, I'm gonna try and and do that uh, that sequence of events to the the very end. It is definitely. I mean, there's a reason, in my opinion, why it's it's the most popular um, event sequence. Uh, the, the, it was very, very well written. All right, this was my yeah. I did this purely Research for concluded. the trade value. Now the nice thing is, is that I really don't want to extend out to any further trade sectors so we can go pretty much instantaneously to um i think at this point i really just do anchorages i don't think i have any other use for this particular station all right more aggressive information campaigns improve the populace's receptiveness to edicts so uh, proclamation broadcast six um again we pretty much have everything in front of us Social has definitely become the less exciting um, branch for me to go down. I suppose because I'm eventually going to be divesting myself of a few farms. Um, let's go for transgenic crops. Also, um, it didn't warn me that I don't have science ships. So I'm a little worried that I... What am I doing? Um, yeah, I don't know who we actually lost because it doesn't seem like any of our science ships have uh, have have lost their um, commanders. I'm not eager to lose them, so I, you know I won't. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna not I'm not gonna go crazy about it, but. Uh, let's 
I think I'm gonna get the upgrades in first, and then I can think about how. Research concluded. Uh, Great Estwani polity has broken off their research agreement. Oh no, but this is with the Nebrite Republican territories. I'm fine with that. Um, in fact, anything that is making these folks more dependent on me is good. Uh, minor technical advances combined with improved shipboard uh, combi is combined with improved shipboard routines for handling munitions uh, to provide a noticeable boost in fire rate. So here, I think this is the time where I need to go down the explosive path, uh, seeing as my titans are full of them. Again, we've abandoned Tachyon lances a while ago. Um, I put a lot behind the energy uh, on energy weapons, and I, I still kind of, in my view, I think it's still worth. Um, I think it's still worth pursuing, but uh, I don't know. I think um, ship upgrades applied. <laughs> we're basically in an internal upgrade cycle. Um, again, I also need to. I actually need to think about what uh, what I'm building. Uh, my fleets into because I've, I've been doing all of these upgrades but I clearly have a lot of slack in my naval capacity that I should be addressing uh, also I definitely need to be boosting my my scout fleets uh, in fact in this case this should be a little bit easier for me so let's wait am I Ship upgrades applied. Okay, it's not as bad as I thought. Um, what I think I'm going to do in this case, um, I will... Yeah, taking them up to 18 seems to be a decent idea. I have no idea whether Ship or not the... Ship upgrades applied. Like, whenever I do this, the fleet manager always seems to come up with really creative ideas about how <laughs> how it should be a it should accomplish its goal um, but in this case let's let's risk it um, I will do reinforce for my scout fleets Yeah, it's actually um, this was the uh, this was the um, the thing that got me kind of got me in touch with the the, uh, the writer. I think I I sent a silly tweet about the uh, about the event, um, and they uh, they sent a reply, and uh, I don't know the the rest is history. Um, I mean, I got very lucky because uh, that game is is. You know, treated Construction the stream completed. very well. Uh, okay, reinforcements. That's good. Um, the stream is being upgraded. Good. Uh, minor improvements to transmission efficiency add up to a sizable reduction in overall energy loss. And we're back to kind of being able to pick whatever I want. Um, I still think going offensive is the the better call. Okay, that's what I needed to do. And for the rest, I think at this point let's um let's start cramming these more uh... Oh, that's right. This was um I was worried about piracy here. Um I think at this point we're going to stop pretending that we can protect our roots this way. Research concluded. Uh, same story. Well, okay. Easter, I'll build another hangar bay, but then we'll throw in some extra anchorages. Uh, I should actually probably be building more of my fleets than wasting time on these, but um, I'll go for the Ship admin upgrades cap just applied. because I can. Uh, how are we? Yeah, we've got Alloys. Knowledge is the key to the universe. With chemical reactions tightly controlled by missile board microprocessors, warhead detonations can be tuned for maximum effect or local conditions at the time of impact. 
So our options are attack speed or minerals from jobs. Definitely attack speed is the more aggressive of the options. All right, Yidra actually is a tough call. Um, oh no, it's not because of the Naval Logistics Office. What's going to be hard are the um, sort of the secondary buildings here. Um, so for instance, on the Faranus Black Hole, really this is all about trying to um, trying to make the most of... Oh, actually, oh, there we go. There's the answer. The trine, the quine, the trine. Once again, the horizon signal in Faranus Black Hole is active. It has upped its game. Once again, the transmission ex includes the exit point's coordinates. It's signed with the private comm keys of Bakugath and Pashna Sutar. But this time, it's a generative text program written in an elderly programming language that creates what appears to be love poems. Love poems directed to Dolshug. Um, they're honestly not very good lo uh, love poems, but it is, our scientists agree, quite difficult to generate love poems procedurally, and quite unusual for black holes to be sending love poems at all. <laughs> well, it asks nicely. Send Dolshug. Or uh, Dosh Doshulg. So this is definitely one that we want a replacement for. Um, although at this point, because I've got a nice big surplus, uh, let's have a chat with the. Uh, let's have a chat with the uh, curators. Oh, we already employ one. All right, I have to do it the old-fashioned way. That's fine. Uh, let's... I don't, I'm not too worried about the more expensive ones, so at this point, something that can last. And it looks like they want me to manually tell it, uh... Every second that I didn't have somebody in, in orbit, I <laughs> lost so much research. I'm really happy the way that works. Good lord. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to deal with my expansion first. Uh, okay, so we've got eight slots available. We're looking for another five. I've got one job available right now, so realistically I need to find four jobs. And... Oh, nope. This is not, this is not difficult at all. So we upgrade this building. And we are most short on exotic... Well, volatile moats are actually going to come back to buy. So I really need to come up with uh, exotic gases and volatile moats. In this case, let's say the volatile moats are my higher priority. So Commerce Megaplexes give me the jobs, and the the moats are the moats. Uh, okay, moving right along. Belzir 2. So this is a refinery world. Similar story here. We want to get up to 70. We've got current jobs, so that's effectively 67 jobs. I need three. Unfortunately, unlike this other planet, um, if I just generate one job... I'm still short too, so in this situation we wind up building a commercial zone. Soul Prime, um, we will start with a new research center. Uh, so that gives me two jobs. We have to, we need to get to 65. I will eventually need more housing. We've got room for three. Yeah, actually, we don't have enough for the next level, so we'll build the uh, district. This is a much more ordered way of uh, improving things, and Saul has not been causing me headaches like some of my other worlds, so I'm going to remember that for the next time that I play. All right, uh, join him. Join him is kind of my breadbasket right now, um, but we've got... Like, we've really expanded out to where we need to be, so unless I want to... Uh, do the upgrade to the food processing facilities, which of course takes moats, which is one of the more important things I could be using right now. Um, the question really is, how do I get another four jobs? Um, this one doesn't have as easy of an answer. I mean, as always, commercial zones are, are a thing. Um... I suppose there is the possibility of putting a research lab down and then just upgrading. 
But that also invites the question, well, if I'm going to do that, why does it have to be a research lab? Why can't it be um, alloys? So let's think. I'm just going to, again, this is one of these cases. I know it's not always the most exciting to sit and watch somebody um, think through this. So my current options. So one, I say I build a bioreactor and this is how I'm going to deal with my food surplus. That's a bad idea right now because it doesn't generate any extra jobs. And I think I had to get rid of some of my bioreactors. So... Um, So yeah, I'm 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 going to keep I'm, so I'm going to stay the course in terms of food, and this is this is a a certain food uh, planet. The question is, what is the other good that it produces? So my realistic op so there are three realistic options here. One, I do the easy choice uh, the easy choice and do commercial zones to just get me to the next level. That's kind of kicking the can down the road. It's not the end of the world because, of course, I'm not above restructuring the economy and a, a major source of consumer goods for me is actually my uh, trade uh, style. I don't know if it'll tell me. Well, I mean, you can get an idea here, right? Trade is my largest source of uh, consumer goods. Um, and that number is only going to go up as uh, I start defending my, uh, my, my trade routes better. The thing is, is that also as I start conquering new worlds, that food and uh, consumer good demand is also going to increase. Um, so commercial zones, technically, they don't just give me money. They get me, um, or energy credits, they also get me um, commercial goods or consumer goods. Um, and the way you can think about that, I actually kind of like generating consumer goods through trade as long as I'm able to defend it. Because, of course, in that particular case, that means that there are consumer goods factories that I'm going to be able to switch into alloy factories. Again, something uh, to think about further down the road. Uh, my honest preference would be to build strategic resources, but it's very clear that I'm not I'm not capable of, of doing that right now. We don't have enough slack in the in the uh, in, in the labor market to be able to afford that. So. Um, this is a really roundabout way of getting to it, but it seems to me the right call here is to go Alloy Foundry. Uh, and the, the reasoning behind that, so this is going to give me two jobs. It's going to go, uh, so I've got 35. Uh, the next job that gets taken up is going to take us to 36. Then we have the additional, so that takes us up to 38. And I know that by upgrading the Alloy Foundry, um, I will be able to get us to the... Um, to the the next uh, the next lock building slot, and I mean at that point I need to decide, you know exactly where I want my my priorities to be. Probably I'll wind up building a commercial um, commercial center and then maybe trade off. Well, say if I build the commercial center, then yeah, I've actually created a problem for myself. I don't think there's any way I catch up here, but something to think about for later. Okay, um, now I deal with my massive unemployment problems again. This is. Largely a function of my, oh, that's right, because I switched buildings. Well, that's fine because we are ready to upgrade this one. Did Mescaban wind up in the same situation? No, they're just generating too many workers. So let's put them on Uleus. Yidra probably has a robot. Yep. Uh, Sayuvis. I'm trying to find ones with balances between jobs and uh, available housing. And in fact, the ones that have lots of jobs available are the ones I'm most interested in, just because it means that that's some easy growth for games. Video games are elaborate experiments in designing command economies. This is dead. <laughs> dead <laughs> I mean, um, for those of you that got to play the supply chain game, um, that one, it's very interesting because um, I, I know there were differences of opinions in terms of like the behavior that was was being observed and and described in that one 
um, there's sort of a difference of opinion in terms of what's going on. So that one was like a, it's a, it, it sort of simulates uh, in a very abstract way sort of supply chain. I'm just slowing it down so I can explain this thing. Um, so like you have the, um, the producer, the warehouse, um, the storefront, and then the consumer. And um, I think the 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 statement on the web page is sort of exploring supply chains, and there's sort of this idea that um, it's explaining why there are shortages when uh, that that may not are necessarily upgrades uh, sorry, applied that aren't necessarily driven by consumer demand. This is one thing that I I think is a little bit um, a little bit more more contentious. Um, but what's kind of interesting to me is I think there is this idea, I think the takeaway that at least one set of people want to get from it is to say, you know, and, and this is why just in time supply chains aren't good and why we need to go in and impose a better system. You know, we, we need to manage it to make sure that there's cert a certain amount here. And of course, as uh, Rasmus, you know, is uh, you know the command economy. Um, the the other perfectly legitimate interpretation from that game is look at how much you are struggling with one slider at four different parts of the economy, and you're trying to tell me that we are somehow going to be able to manage the real thing better because you know the there's the real like the 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 game. While I understand the 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 plan to um, to sort of take it as as this um, you know a little thought experiment to say okay well you know if we if we just get a better handle on you know on 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 what businesses are doing um, then then we'll live in utopia. Um, but the funny thing is is that you can actually take the exact same game and uh, and make a fairly I think a, a fairly reasonable argument to say that the reason why we prefer these decentralized solutions is that, you know, it's really hard to be in charge of everything and generally it doesn't work very well. Um, obviously it is up to the person playing the game to decide what they want to take away from it, but uh, I just, I, I found it really interesting uh, that the, the argument actually was essentially the same, but the conclusion was completely different in both cases. Uh, and that was that was really fun. Uh, anyways, uh, and for those of you that haven't played Supply Chain, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. So, uh, the horizon signal, where the end comes from. This will be the end of me, Dolshulk says at the, at the briefing before launch. I know I won't come back, but I think I always knew this would happen. Whatever is in the hole has been waiting for us for a long, long time. I think it's been waiting for me since before I was born. Once again, the single pilot ship approaches the exit point. Once again, space boils like a fever. Again, our sensor arrays soak up fascinating data. This time, Dolsheng is silent. The telemetry becomes intermittent, and then it too is silent. The ship has reached the exit point. The conditions around it are returning to normal. Nothing has happened. Nothing? The monitoring team mutter furiously. The ship is different. In fact, it's a different ship. It's back a guts vessel, lost these years past, drifting now away from the exit point. A salvage team finds it pristine and empty, no trace of crew, no sign of violence. But there's a journal entry in uh, Bakugath's na uh, name titled, What Was Will Be. Our scientists review it nervously. Impossible, one says. I hope so, says another. The ship is renamed the Foundling and returned to service. The signal, dead or sleeping, says nothing at all ever again. And yet this may not be the end. <laughs> All right. Well, um, at this point, I'm just going to use this as an excuse to add more scientists to my ranks. So, by the way, I'll be honest with you. One job I would love to have, and I have really struggled to be able to communicate this to uh, companies. Um, I think it's probably just because my resumes suck. But uh, like the sorry, my my accomplishments are all right my presentation probably uh could use a lot of work um but i will be honest with you i would love to uh to do the the analysis for um for game particularly live service games the one or you know ones where you're going to have a lot of um you know a lot of information about the decisions that players are making um because i think there there are definitely some really uh naive ways to approach those problems that 
won't necessarily make the game any better. Um, but uh, when, in response to the idea of, uh, you know, video games are elaborate experiments and command economies, like, I think a lot of decisions in a lot of games, and not necessarily the ones that you would think of, um, can sort of be boiled down to sort of these constrained optimization problems, um, which, you know, most economics has sort of been designed to handle. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential in there, and it's it's one that I'd personally find very fascinating to work with. But I also kind of appreciate that these this is the sort of data that a company is going to want to keep to itself. Uh, so it's it's hard to get my hands on it. All right. Um, I don't know why I did that. Um, I should come up with my candidates for... Well, okay, no, while I'm doing it. So we've got Willeus, uh Cador, Neville. Let's go. Okay. I suspect I'm not going to find another planet with more than a thousand uh, research, but let's just verify that. So Yublion is looking kind of attractive. Yeah, Sol is the... I think at this point I'm probably going to be pretty reluctant to add more scientists to um, to assist research. I think we've, we've kind of hit the, the limits of what we can expect from that, but that's still not a bad return. Uh, also, I'm pretty sure I saw... All right, so that was the Ecumenopolis. Oh no, Mescaban. Mescaban is three days away from becoming my next. Oh, I thought it was gonna like, <laughs> I thought it was gonna nicely transition over rather than pop up. <laughs> All right, Ecumenopolis, Mescaban Prime encased. Layers upon layers of urban sprawl eclipse the globe's crust, and it is done. A scant few years have passed since the start of the grand project, but it is already difficult to recall what the surface of Mescaban Prime was like. Verdant? Rugged? It's all steel now, miles in every direction. A place once molded by chance and the unthinking laws of nature, now a design wrought from indomitable purpose. Oh yeah, I mean, I've, I've, everything about Stellaris, in my opinion, is is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I re I remember when these were added and ship upgrades. I didn't applied. even I didn't even really care what it gave me. I just knew I really wanted one that looked like it. <laughs> um. <laughs> I really do need to start expanding out my fleets. Like the the eternal, uh, the eternal upgrade cycle is killing me. Um, but so the biggest thing here, the you know, it's going to be nice to be able to get some extra um, arcologies and whatnot. Uh, I might even be able to consider you know removing some of the residential arcologies because we just have so much surplus. Um, but the biggest thing here, of course, is the science bonus. Um, I think we can quantify that by clicking on one of the researchers. Um, so the Ecumenopolis gives a 20% bonus to research, which, of course, on a planet that is generating a thousand in each category. I mean, that's probably after the bonuses. Um, but that was kind of close to generating a thousand in each category. That's a really nice... Um, really nice little kicker to give uh, to give your science worlds. Uh, of course, we do still have some extra bonuses that we can get out of this. So if we do the foundry arcology, we get um, we get the alloys. If we do the industrial arcology, we get consumer goods. Why we would do that, I have no idea. And if I really wanted, I could build a leisure arcology. 
Um, but again, at this point, why would I, why would I go for the extra unity? Um, at this point, um, what it means is basically my Ecumenopolis worlds, in addition to the fact that they are generating uh, terrifying amounts of research, uh, they now also have these massive forges, which are going to be generating a lot of, um, a lot of uh, alloys for me. Uh, and so they become some of my most desirable and uh, productive worlds. Okay, so the next question is, what world do I want to encase in... Uh, in concrete next? I know we were working on some, I just don't remember what the next candidate was. So yeah, Cadar is a really bad example of one that I would want to do that on uh, because it generates, uh, because of its generators. I, I can, like if I have to, I will, but I feel like there are better opportunities. Um, ah, actually, you know what? It looks like we were priming this one for an Ecumenopolis. So Obasayak, I will keep in mind. Uh, this wouldn't be a terrible one either, although... Honestly, the plants don't make me ecstatic. Or the, the synthetic plants. Uh, yeah, it looks like Obasayak was really the one that we were we were pushing for that. I also think uh, Satatoni is, is going to be one that um, we queue up. It's always sad to see the energy go away, but I don't think we have any idea what we were doing with this planet. Okay, well, Obasayak is the one that's kind of ready to go, so uh, Arcology Project. Oh, we don't have enough minerals. Surely they can't cost that much. There we go. We're actually kind of short in terms of our, our mineral production. I could I could stand to, um, to kind of give my economy a shot in the arm on that front, but... Um, at this point, we're generating enough cash that it's it's just as easy to <laughs> to push the buttons. Now, I am a little curious. Again, we're not quite ready for the fight, but yeah, they're really stubborn on their economic power. I really don't think that we've we've quite accomplished enough to make it worth uh, worth the shift anyway. All right, at this point, Delcor's got a ship upgrades applied. <laughs> Again, back to the eternal upgrade path. Antaron, what's going on with you? Right, we unemployed the specialists because we turned this into a paradise dome. I think I just need to let them decay into a standard job. All right. I'm assuming the Cooperative of Menjusana, that's going to be uh, closing soon, too. This war is extremely inconvenient for my, my plans. Uh, all right, I need to figure out what I want to do with this mining world. So we're, we're kind of at the end in terms of employment. Um, I think probably the right call in this case. Oop, the Zydran free traders have stopped guaranteeing the independence of the Neverite Republican territories. That's good for me. Um, oh, am I still not able to... I really wanted to guarantee their independence. Um, all right, uh, where was I? So, okay, so Cater Secundus, I think it's pretty obvious that I want to put an alloy foundry there. Um, this world, I guess the best I can really hope for at this point is just to kick the can down the road with um, I 
Yeah, see, this is the real shame. So I'm, I'm going to build another... Um, I'm going to build another... Uh, um, sorry, words are failing me. Another one of these synthetic um, strategic resource uh, generators. I think, again, we're going to be focusing on alloys, so chemical plants is the right call here. That's going to take us up to three. Where I actually need to get us, though, is up to um, 80 pops for the system capital complex. Um, it's pretty obvious here that I have to give up a mining district. This is the other shame, right, is that the size of the planet was pretty small, although I... Right, if I want it, I can embiggen the planet. This is actually one case where I'm willing to do that. I kind of hate that I spent uh, all that influence, but this is this is actually one of those cases where it's justified. Okay, you bly on. Um, we do have a spare 100. Administrative cap. I'm not crazy about the idea of getting caught out with that though, so I think I'm gonna move on. And again, we're um, we're short on minerals. It's so interesting that I, for the longest time, I never knew what to do with my minerals. Um, but I think now we've pushed too far in the other direction. Although speaking of things I've been neglecting. Let's take a look at the state of my navy. So the stream has been upgrading. Um, Ship upgrades But it doesn't applied. seem like we've really been... Yeah, so I've got two titans, and yet I have not actually built my second um, replacement fleet. So I'll wait till they're done upgrading, but I think at this point I need to, I need to have a serious think about what... Applied. Uh, what I'm trying to accomplish here, so... Ah, uh, damn it. Um, all right. This is going to cost me a little bit in terms of maintenance, but this is just kind of for my sanity. Okay, so let's compare them to the core. So this is not my favorite choice here because I've got 40 points that I'm going to be uh, playing around with, which I may not, like, I may not make the same decision with a 190 fleet uh, and adding another 40 fleet, um, uh, fleet capacity. Uh, if I were to design this from the start, I might make other decisions. But in this case here, I just want to, I want to really rough out um, my, uh, my main my, my main uh, fleet template and actually it occurred to me the sail is a little bit closer okay so a titan seven battleships 11 cruisers let's start with that okay uh so it's just destroyer city at this point um so 20 destroyers 34 corvettes okay um Okay, that's the destroyers taken care of. And then straight after that, I think it was all Corvettes. So what are we looking at there? 34. Ah, oh, this is going to be a pain. So that was just in case I uh, I ran out of money. We've got quite a few alloys though, so it wasn't wasn't the biggest uh, worry. All right, restructuring the managerial web linking core worlds to the capital can help alleviate administrative stressors and information choke points that frequently arise within a budding empire. Uh, at this point, let's say. Well, I'll do the leader lifespan, but that's mostly just because I want to show what contempt I have for the army. This, by the way, I think is going to be one of the things that we might see improved in a future patch. I don't think it's going to be a high priority. I, like, it's not something that I would expect to see within, like, the next DLC or something like that. But I have a feeling that 
Well, when Wiz was on the game, he was talking about how he felt... Um, He's kind of talking about how he felt that there could be a better espionage system in the game. I'm actually inclined to agree with that. Um, and then the uh, other thing, this is more just kind of a, a feeling that I get from uh, people who who are Stellaris fans. I think the other feeling is that um, the army, like the invasion, I mean, the invasion system has changed from the original game. But it's still not... I don't really feel like it's as interesting as navies. Uh, which, of course, makes... I mean, it's really completed. hard to make armies as interesting in, in science fiction um, as, the, as the navies. Um, but with that in mind, I, I sort of feel like they're... Those are two things that might find themselves harmonizing quite well. In, in a future patch. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if we saw something like that. On the other hand, too, it's maybe not necessarily the most urgent change for uh, for Stellaris to make, so maybe we, we won't see it. All right, miniaturized pre-igniters 4. Advances in miniaturization allow for more rapid loading and discharging of rocket-propelled payloads. So let's say I really do want to do the kinetic weapons damage. In this case here, actually, the 5% uh, minerals from jobs is not a bad option given the fact that I've been running into some shortfalls. Um, this is a little surprising. Research concluded. All right. Again, I don't really know what I'm doing with my consumer goods anymore. This is uh, a bit of a problem. Perfecting the firing cadence of laser weaponry is a task that could keep the engineering elite of any given planet busy for centuries. Hello, Joshi Man. Long live the mighty system chalk and his mighty star empire. You sure know how to make a guy feel welcome. <laughs> how you doing, Joshi Man? Um, okay. Um, Omega Theory is going to take, like, nothing uh, to research. So uh, the universe tends irresistibly onwards and downwards. That tendency cannot be reversed, but it can be subverted for a price. Yeah, let's do it. It's like one month. Just woke up. First of three nights off. So, oh, great. I hope you've got some exciting plans, or at the very least, um, it opens up some, some good opportunities for you. Uh, we're still not at capacity for these ships. I have a feeling that it's probably not going to... It's not actually going to... Oh, actually, hang on. So the breach got theirs. The reef and the wind still seem to be short. Interesting. Research concluded. All right. Now, when I actually implement the Omega Theory is a whole other question, um, but I'll worry about that later. Uh, energy weapon attack speed is pretty much an always pick when I can. Um, I was going to say I'm surprised I'm allowed to upgrade this, but then I remembered why, because we're waiting for new ships. Uh, at this point, I might as well recruit a new leader. Um, Gonna do some chores around the house, go for a walk around your neighborhood before the sun comes up, and then uh, get to the gym. Hey, nice. So they definitely have no shortage of alloys. Um, it's really sort of a lack of a lack of uh, decisiveness on my part that's keeping me from. Uh, from taking advantage of this. So, for the time being, um, I'm, I'm going to start by focusing on my my main systems. Uh, so, more this is obviously a research world, so we will continue accordingly. 
I'm curious if we decided, for some reason we decided not to terraform this world. I think it might be because of the the preferences of the population. Yeah, this is definitely, this is a conquered world. So I have a feeling that I have happiness problems if they... This is a hard one, actually. Yeah, okay, so there's the engineering bonus that we get. Yeah, I think we're gonna leave this be. Yeah, I mean, I, I almost never use the fleet manager because I just find it more, I find it more trouble than it's worth. Um, this is obviously with all due respect to the developers. I appreciate that that is not necessarily an easy thing to employ. By the way, this is great. Like, I, I love it when I play uh, more open empires to just see, like, what this makes me think of is, like, there's a, an older movie, um, Men in Black, which I, th I still think holds, I, I think it's a, I definitely think it's a, a um, I, I think it's, it's still a really good, I think, this, okay, so the thing that really appeals to me about Men in Black I haven't seen any of uh, the X Files except for its um, its movie Fight the Future, um, and um, but like I I think X Files and Men in Black were uh, were out around the same time. And I think one of the things that I like so much is that the most standard thing that you imagine when you think of something like Men in Black or Aliens or, a, you know, the government conspiracy, um, you tend to think of that very seriously. You think of, like, the cigarette smoking man. You think of, uh, you know, this very, you know, this thing that takes itself very seriously. And yet there's this really interesting sort of idea. It's almost like, you know, imagine your experiences of government bureaucracy um, and then map those onto the people who are responsible for uh, keeping the, um, you know, keeping the world safe from from all you know, the intergalactic death ray and whatnot. Uh, and it's, it's one of these things where it seems to be such an obviously good movie idea. Although I think it was like a comic before that. Uh, again, like I don't know a ton about the background of it, um, but I think one, I kind of like the fact that it seems to be that like the government's covering up the aliens was in the air because I guess Independence Day was probably uh, coming out around that time too. Um, that just seemed to be something that was kind of in the air, but to be able to do that in a funny way, um, I, th I think is a stroke of genius. Uh, I mean, it's it's just a funny movie. Like that's that's reason enough. Um, but whenever I see this one, like I I still remember kind of the scene where they go through the the like the base and you you just see this this you know massive terminal um, of of every species imaginable. Um, so I sort of like that. Uh, you're a fan of the X Files. Have you ever watched Fringe? I've not. No. I mean, again, like I only ever saw I only ever saw the uh, Fight the Future. Um, I uh, I never really saw anything else. Not not for you know disliking it or anything like that. But um, it it wasn't um, it just wasn't on my radar really. Like it's. Um, Maybe on my radar isn't the right answer. Like it, it wasn't, I didn't really like, it wasn't the sort of TV that went, man, what was that even on? Like it, it seems that the time to watch it had passed by the time that I sort of was aware of it. Uh, and I mean, like there's obviously you can, you know, get a box set or something like that. It's not like I don't have opportunities to, to watch it. Um, but you know, it's a little bit, Actually, here's another example. Like, I've seen a couple of episodes of a, of a medical drama that I, I rather like uh, called House. I'm going to assume that probably most of you are familiar with it. I don't know. It seemed to be reasonably well known. Like, I kind of have this theory that Fox does one type of show. 
uh, and it's an incredibly talented individual uh, is allowed to be a jerk to everyone, but because they're so good at what they do, um, people tolerate them. And I mean, this this explains, you know, the Gordon Ramsay shows. This is House. This is even like Bill O'Reilly when he was was on Fox. Like, this seems to be the the gift that keeps on giving to that network. Um, but uh, but yeah, so like I've I've seen quite a few episodes of House. I really like the Sherlock Holmes references all all throughout it. Um, but uh, I, I will also admit um, I haven't seen all of it, and it's one of these cases where, you know, I, I there's nothing about that show that I dislike. Um, but a little bit like the X Files, it's sort of like it's not like there's new House episodes coming out, and so the question then becomes like when. You know, when do you sit down and see the other stuff of the, you know, the other episodes of this thing that you enjoyed? So, yeah, exactly. Um, apparently, upgrades like, applied. I'm obviously nowhere near it, but uh, I heard apparently in Silicon Valley, construction um, completed. Af shortly after Steve Jobs died, there was this phenomena of a bunch of like assholes and turtlenecks walking around. Um, being mean to people to sort of take on the mantle of Steve Jobs, uh, clearly unaware of the fact that, you know, Jobs was a, a remarkable uh, individual and very successful despite his personality problem, or like his, you know, the problems with his, his personality and his, his style, uh, not because of. <laughs> um, actually, if you guys haven't read it, I really like the Walter Isaacson uh, biography of, of Steve Jobs. I thought it did a, I thought it did a really good job. I haven't seen the movies, but actually that's not true. I saw an old, uh, like an old made for TV movie called, um, uh, called, um, Pirates of Silicon Valley, um, which is pretty good actually. I thought, I thought at least, um, but, uh, obviously like that movie, I think came out after Jobs had just recently become the head of Apple again. And uh, this was when Microsoft did the, like they injected a bunch of, of money into uh, into Apple. So, you know, the, the whole story of like the iPod and the iPhone and stuff like that. And like as a Canadian, that's not necessarily a story that I am fond of because of course, you know, research in motion. Now BlackBerry used to have that, that market. And then obviously Apple did a much better job. <laughs> and look, I never had a BlackBerry. So, you know, I've, I've always had an iPhone. Um, but, uh, but yeah, obviously the, the, the parts that people really focus on on that story are not at all present in, in Pirates of Silicon Valley, specifically because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, and I, I think that's why I found that such an interesting uh, movie. Does that mean because Chalk is good at talking, he's a dickhead? I mean, there are some people from some of the student econ seminars who may have some opinions on that but they're obviously wrong as just as wrong as they were in those seminars. So, <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I try. It's important to tell the jobs and gate story in parallel with each other within the context of the time period that they live. I think that makes it easier to, yeah. Um, it's actually one thing that I rather like about the Isaacson biography um it's it so i think the thing that it likes i i get the feeling that you know it's it's always cool to construction uh, complete you know play the hipster card or talk about how you didn't really care about apple or how you know the stuff that they make isn't actually good and um you know only idiots buy it or whatever like every time you know on twitch i mean i used to stream on a mac laptop that was the first thing that i you know that I did the broadcast on and you know every time that fact came out I kept having to hear how apparently I'm just really stupid because I buy Mac products um, but so like there's definitely the cool 
too cool for school uh, mentality. And I think people are not just reflexively going to talk about, you know, why they don't like Steve Jobs or why they don't like Apple. Um, which is not to say that there aren't, you know, legitimate criticisms of the of of the platform or of the of the the product. Um, and then, of course, I think probably people are very familiar with sort of the incredible either brand loyalty or the, you know, the cult of the founder. Um, you know, there's definitely a, a very strong tendency for people to you know, to, to want to, to hear about St. Steve of, of Cupertino. Um, and I think what I really liked about the, the Isaacson biography was, I think it did a very good job of talking about, you know, the time period and specific qualities that had Apple turn out the way that it did and specifically turn out in both the good and the bad. Um, like, I, I feel like that was a properly done biography, um, as opposed to some of the other more business oriented books, which despite claims to objectivity or, you know, despite claims to, um, you know, to try and give you an unvarnished view of what's going on, it really kind of winds up becoming, you know, and it was foreordained because this guy is such a genius and, you know, it was... It was inevitable that they were going to succeed because they're just so smart at business. Um, and it's a shame, right? Because there's a lot of value that you can actually get out of seeing successful people fail um, and either how they handled it or to see how people who, you know, we otherwise look up to didn't necessarily have that be a direct path. And yet it's one of the easiest things. Like, I history i don't find this as much or maybe it's just because i know the material a bit better but definitely when it's business biographies um i sometimes have to avoid rolling my eyes okay i, I haven't seen the i think that's the one that's uh that's an adaptation of the isaacson book uh, i haven't read i haven't sorry i read it but i haven't uh i haven't seen it Um, all right. Sorry, I was kind of filibustering to actually avoid making some hard decisions here. But so um, first things first, let's get my let's get my chemical plants, and then I'll upgrade the commercial zone. Well, this one's an easy one. <laughs> That'll get me two jobs. I'll kick the. I'll kick things off with uh, the first upgrade on the alloy foundries, but I'm going to need to keep an eye on that one. Unfortunately, when I lose the... Uh, like, when I, I fill the last one, I don't get the little warning from the the house to uh, to say keep, um, keep upgrading. Um, for PL... Um, we do not have a commercial. Oh, okay, yeah, this is the one that had all the bioreactors. Um, that probably wasn't the smartest choice, if I'm completely honest. Um, I need three jobs. Um, yeah, it's just easy to build commercial zones. <laughs> No, um, it's. I'm definitely not. Uh, I'm definitely not making a political statement. Um, I, I do not believe there is uh, a filibuster in uh, Canadian politics, which doesn't mean like. Um, I think it's. It's just like any other legislative body. Like if there is, if legislation has not passed um, at the time. Um, at the time that the government or at that parliament is dissolved. So this would either be through the government losing a confidence motion or uh, the prime minister requesting it. Um, this is one feature that maybe uh, some of my um, my viewers who aren't, uh, you know, aren't, don't have um, kind of the parliamentary style of government that Canada does. Uh, Canada is a little odd in the sense that at least as far as the letter of the rule is concerned, I know that there has been sort of an effort to try and, and put something uh, a little more fixed in place. But 
it is possible for the government to dissolve parliament. There's a little nuance to this. So, like, the governor general needs to approve it and whatnot. But, like, basically, if you are the government and let's say that you have a majority just to make things a little bit simpler, um, you there is a, a deadline for when an election must be called. Um, but you can dissolve parliament, which will bring about an election, which means that the incumbent is able to kind of pick the circumstances under which the election occurs. Um, whereas, of course, when you have something like the United States, you know that every two years the House is, is up uh, and a certain number of Senate uh, senators. And then, you know, every four years you've got uh, the, the, the executive um, and it's it's actually kind of hard to say whether one is necessarily better than the other, because obviously in the case of the states, you sort of have this almost perpetual campaigning now. Um, it, it seems like you can't possibly start early enough to uh, uh, to, to run your, your election campaign. Um, but on the other hand, like... I don't know. Could could you imagine what it would be like if the president got to decide when, um, you know, when when the election gets held? Um, and I mean, in the case that, that that's not necessarily that bad of an analogy, because in the case of Canada, uh, the prime minister is a one of the members of parliament, so you don't necessarily vote for Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh or. Uh, Andrew Scheer, who are the current leaders of the the three largest political parties, um, you know, you you vote for your member of parliament. Your member of parliament is usually a member of a party, and it's the leader of that party that that usually becomes the the prime prime minister. Do empire senators filibuster? Um. But <laughs> you're not even in the legislative branch yet. You're already campaigning for re-election. Yeah. Um, there is, by the way, like there is a ton of very interesting research on these kinds of questions from an economic point of view in, in political economy. So you will have these models of lobbying. You'll have these models of sort of constitutions and government systems um, and specifically trying to quantify the costs and the benefits of, of each of them. Um, so there, for instance, there are models of, um, lobbying that actually can produce some fairly interesting results in terms of saying that lobbying is a useful, uh, a useful tool, which doesn't mean like, you know, we'll just open the floodgates and, and, you know, you, you know, whoever fundraises the most becomes the, the new leader. Um, but it definitely leads to maybe some counterintuitive results in terms of what's what's going on. And the idea here is not just to take the, you don't go looking for the model that gives you the result that you want, but rather you look at the the construction of it and you you get a better idea in terms of how all these different mechanisms uh, work. Um, anyways, the Loop Temple, Signs in Stone. Archaeologists have found the forgotten temple in the remote highlands of Mavil Prime, buried for centuries, but recently exposed by an earthquake. Dating techniques suggest it's a pre-industrial relic, hand-hewn from volcanic rock. However, the recurring symbol on the walls and radial altar, a Mobius-looped serpent consuming its own tail, has no obvious precedent in our early history, and the inscriptions use an unknown alphabet. One excitable archaeologist suggests that it's a relic left by an unknown precursor race. In a presumably meaningless coincidence, the quake seems to have occurred at the same time as the final message from the black hole in the Faranus black hole. This merit study or ominous. Situation log has been updated. Um, so we'll just hit the... There's really no reason to not to research it at this point. Construction completed. The thing I need to be careful about is to avoid the temptation to throw everything at Mescaban. Research concluded.
All right, regiments of periodic cell revitalization. Sorry, regimens of periodic cell revitalization treatments keep the leader class spry and active beyond traditionally expected lifespans. Um, so at this point, I need to invest in the army. Let's give them the health. And changes in how mineral deposits are evaluated relative to each other lead to more efficient boring patterns. Uh, that one, I actually need to make some decisions. I think probably I said I was going to go heavy on the kinetic weapons. So let's do the attack speed first. All right, so we're 10 ships away from where we needed to be. I mean, again, the um, ship upgrades applied. One of the drawbacks here is um, I'm doing this so that I can get the Titan in place to start building up its uh, its fleet, or its um, like it's it's the the capital ships that it's going to use. Um, but again, at this point, I'm okay, you know, firing out a bunch of size 190 um, fleets for the impending war. Speaking of, let's see where we're at. All right, so obviously we haven't been able to generate enough economic strength to be able to... In fact, I'm kind of curious... Okay, we do have some claims. That's good. I will actually consider making a few more, but we are waiting for three months. And I'm going to be a bit late on this, it looks like. So I think what I'm going to do, um, I should. Now, see, I was originally going to try and, and do some kind of a feint on the side here. What's probably better for me to do, I'll take one uh, set of ships and I'll sort of run them. I'll run them through this area where it's very unlikely the Akano have claims. That's probably my better option here. Oh, I do have economic strength. I just don't have... I don't have overwhelming economic strength. Okay, the river I'm okay uh, upgrading, though. I think it's also fair to say that the 13th Pelagic Excursion... Well, actually, you know what? They might be ready to go sooner than I think. Yeah, it's 10 days. That was unexpected. So, of course, I'd love to get them upgrading and whatnot, but um, priorities. All right, so... Um, Let's start with the seven battleships and the eleven... Eleven cruisers. I really need to find a better use for this stuff. Now notice I've been neglecting my um, stations, so I, I do kind of need to be careful about the uh, the um, fleet cap. But again, in my opinion, I, I really should be building uh, I should be building much larger fleets, and I should have had them a lot sooner. So um, the idea here is that I don't want a previous bad decision to sort of be an anchor for me uh, moving forward. I'm just gonna accept the. I'm going to accept the hit. Oh, wow. Now I'm at the max energy credits. Well, um, this is going to seem a little silly, but I am actually going to stock up on minerals. And because I can, let's also get some alloys. Okay, so that was seven battleships. Uh, one, two. So 11 cruisers up. Uh, 20 ba uh, destroyers.
This is just kind of so I can keep them as nice round numbers. And what this will do is this will give me some alloys to put towards my station upgrades. Was quick. <laughs> Knowledge is the key to the universe. All right, new developments in tech cooling regularly surface, improving the stability and efficiency of our weapon systems, keeping them from blowing up the ships on which they are mounted. Um, shield hit points. Okay, so this probably means that we can go to war with them. It does indeed. So, I mean, again, the thing I'd really like to be able to do here would be to um, uh, offer subsidiary status. Um, not that I'd be able to do that uh, while we're at war anyway, um, but uh, specifically I know I'm not able to do it because of the equivalent economic power. So the answer to me, again, seems to be that I try and take as many, uh, I try and take as many sort of rich planets off them as I can. Um, also, you know, somewhat desirable ones for a, uh, from a defensive or otherwise, um, utilitarian point of view. Uh, I wonder if I can get away with these two. Wow. Okay. Um, I am somewhat prioritizing, um, planets that have, or sorry, I'm, I'm somewhat prioritizing systems with planets. It's a tough call, right? Because if I go down this path and all of a sudden there's like 200 trade power, there's a, you know, a, a path to the, you know, the border with the Divine Pazjok state and whatnot. Um, but uh, I think it's kind of heroic to think that, I mean, what's this going to cost? This is going to be 96. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just kind of feel like this is something somewhat defensible. Um, there are sort of natural choke points. There are things that I, I know I'm going to be able to get away with. Uh, if I try and spread out too far here, when I do ultimately incorporate these guys into my empire, um, I just think it's going to create some harder, harder problems. From this moment forth shall be known as TV. Joshi Van, have you played Supply Chain? The special project has concluded. All right, the Loop Temple, Time and Stone. Our scientists have learned a great deal about the subterranean temple, but uh, some questions remain. A roof aperture along the radial altar suggests that it was once a solar calendar, but it's so badly uh, damaged by the earthquake that we can't be certain. If the builders found any particular dates important, we'll never know which ones. Uh, we've had better luck with the unknown alphabet. It's a debased variant of a better known uh, Hyrax site. Heratic script, uh, not an alien language at all, and we've successfully deciphered it. The temple is dedicated to the waiting worm, or the worm in waiting. Most of the inscriptions are sonorous poetic invocations requesting its appearance, or, if read the, in the other direction, its departure. There's also a body of inscriptions describing the operations of the universe, uh, which our more excitable archaeologist swears contains references to advanced field equations. Nothing new to us, but very impressive for a temple of this vintage. We have yet to find a physicist who's prepared to go on the record in agreeing that the references are meaningful, though. The temple holds no cosmic secrets or alien weapons, as far as we can tell, but its dark spaces have a distinctive menacing beauty, and the poetry of the invocations to the worm in waiting becomes fashionable. They are set to popular music, and they are published in collections. So we can open the loop temple to the public for a happiness bonus. We could reserve the um, temple for academic study. This gives a flat bonus of social research, which I'm, I'm maybe not that interested in right now. Or uh, there's something wrong here, seal the temple. Better safe than sorry. So really what I want to look at is do I want to get a permanent happiness bonus or do I want to get a flat 2000 uh, research? And I mean, honestly, at this point, given the fact this, this is less than half a month's uh, society research at this point. Okay, so just give me a quick second here. You, you may get a kick out of this. Uh, I just need a... If you can just give me a quick minute. 
Um, I realize me privately messaging someone does not make for the most stimulating viewing material. <laughs> um, but I don't want to forget this. What genre of music is a band named Worm in Waiting? Ooh. Um, I mean, aren't there like a bunch of references to the worms in, in uh, The Wall? Aren't, aren't we obligated to, to make some kind of a Pink Floyd reference here? Or mid 2000s emo. Uh, yes. Okay. This will. This is. This is the audience interaction part of the stream because I'm definitely failing to uh, to be as engaging as I, I am on um, on other nights. Uh, what what genre would you let's let's get the best uh, let's get the best recommendation for music styles for the worm in waiting. A rendezvous. Uh, the the breach is being hailed by the uh, Syzygy. I, I can never pronounce this correctly. Uh, of of Jomar of Jomar Limited. Uh, this, despite the fact that uh, the Syzygy, I really should find out what that exactly is. Uh, isn't sending any ID codes. We recognize no ship of that name has ever been commissioned from it. Uh, commissioned. Its commanding officer claims to be Captain Sungab. Hmm. Our admirable of that name is uh, is alive. Uh, sorry, hmm. Our admiral of that name is alive, well, and elsewhere. The captain that appears on the screen is clearly uh, Sungab, but a scarred, haunted, decrepit, wrecked edition of Sungab, face glossy with plasma burns and older, much older. The bridge in the background looks just as scarred and decrepit, but the captain's voice is firm and clear. Finally, you're here. I've waited so long. My punishment is to die in battle against you. Please end me. I'm sorry. Um, what's happening here? Are you really Sungab? I am. Are you the same post uh, Meta Jomar you were last year? Every day is a death. Every future is a choice. Time is a labyrinth, not a road. Uh, I chuckle. It sounds like the chuckle hurts. Ask the loop. Uh, if you want to end it, why wait? A warship is full of ways to die. Don't you remember? Of course you won't, yet. And you might not uh, now, uh, not if you do it right. The loop needs its sacrifices, and it needs them just so. An agonized coughing chuckle. You don't want to trifle with the loop. What is the loop? The loop is what came first and what comes next. The worm in waiting, and I suppose the worm is the loop. Let's uh, let's say time is a labyrinth. The cha uh, captain begins to gesture futilely. Then the loop is its monster, or its maker. Oh, I can't explain it, and you'll know more soon. You did in my past. Weapons locked? Before you go, did you learn anything useful? Uh, the captain gives a scar-stretched grin. I hope that you'd ask that. Sending data now. Sun, uh, sun gab out. Charging its weapons. I always really liked this moment. Uh, okay. The messenger, what was, will be. Uh, the breach has located a small, minimally powered artificial object broadcasting a looping signal at a local range only. These sorts of things usually turn out to be escape pods, and this looks like one of those. It's been out here a long time. When the crew cracks it open, carefully observing quarantine procedures, they find ancient remains preserved by the sterile pod environment. So far, not unusual. The captain of the breach indicates, however, that they did not expect to find the Jamaran words what was will be, what will be was, uh, daubed on the wall in the bodily fluids of the, pod's past, of the pod's occupant, who the crew are now wryly referring to as the messenger. They add that there are some equally unexpected anatomical similarities to the messenger's species and our own. 
All right, well, this uh, ship has absolutely no hope against <laughs> against the uh, the the battle uh, the battle station. So no no worries there. Situation log has been updated. Captain, that will be. Uh, Sungab is silent in the days that follow. It is no small thing to hear that you are already dead, but in time that silence becomes a determination, an almost reckless confidence. So, worrying has foredoomed as a, uh, to a rendezvous trait, or what was will be what will be was. All right, but I do have something for a science ship to work on now, so let's take the one in Sol. Ah, crap. Um... There we go. Scientist the founder species? Oh, come on! I don't have any founder species anymore. They're all... <laughs> yeah, something tells me that uh, the that the horizon signal is gonna get a little uh, gonna get a little weird, uh, seeing as we're doing it so late. <laughs> the mecha worm, yeah. Actually, now that I think of that, is a terrifying prospect. Okay, uh, I screwed up at some point. I think I kept moving people off of that planet, but that's not the right call. Um, I may have need for specialists on other worlds, but at this point I'm just going to leave it be. Uh, I wonder why our amenities is so low. I probably should have thought that through. Um, Ship upgrades applied. Ah, but when I get more, um, when I get more of my bureaucrats, then people will be happy. It really, that is that is all that you need. More more bureaucrats, and everybody's going to be happy. I feel like the core needs to be at the vanguard. Let's let's not lose our heads. Uh, Obasayak, right? I mean, it's becoming an arcology. Oh crap! Actually, the arcology project's going to take forever. While um, well, that's fine. We'll just move them off to to other planets. Uh, Kador, we know. Vanico, uh, I don't feel good about it, but I obviously have to do it. Radamario, we just ship people off planet. And what I'm actually going to do this time is I'm going to look for places with available jobs, but also with lots of housing. Hey, the resort world's um, trying to find... Okay, so it's got three available jobs, but not enough housing yet. Um, so pretty clear I'm going to need the extra housing. This is the problem is the, you know, once I get on this treadmill, it's it's really never going to stop. Um, I think I'm actually going to let this sort itself out, because I think with the extra pops... Yeah, so for every two pops, you get an extra clerk job. So right now we have three available jobs. We'll have five uh, housing slots available. And so um, essentially we'll add two more, two more jobs, which will give us an additional one, which means we get basically a total of four. We'll actually have five at the, at the end of this. Um, but that'll be enough to push me into the, the 30 pops uh, section and then we can figure out what uh, what I want to get done with that. Sayuvis, on the other hand, um, I think we're just gonna ship ship people off. I'm not gonna think too hard about it. And then Navel. I've already selected Navel. I'm an idiot. You'd like to apply for a job. 
Really? And, and Joe Martin, you, you, you're going to volunteer uh, to sign up for a job in a world that you know has just opened the, uh, the Horizon Signal event? Research concluded. You'd like to apply for a supply chain manager and keep you stocked on toilet paper. Well, funny thing, I'm just going to read the telemetry. And no, <laughs> doesn't. As much as I would love to have that implemented, that is unfortunately not something inside. Um, I was not expecting Willaeus to be out of jobs. Um, I have a feeling this is going to really hurt my minerals soon. Um, tell you, if you get a perfect score, we'll talk. Actually, so here's a funny thing. Um, I was responsible for balancing that. And uh, my economist friend said that it's too hard, that there's no way to win. <laughs> I was a little amused by that. Also, it was just really encouraging because uh, I thought it was too easy. Again, that may not have been the right uh, choice, but at this point, if there are jobs that are available in other in other locations, so uh, I might as well get them producing useful things right away. Uh, carefully tuning pain receptors to allow soldiers to fight through what previously would have been debilitating injuries. Uh, let's give them aggressive conditioning so they do more damage. And then minor technical advances combined with improved shipboard routines for handling munitions to provide a noticeable boost in fire rate. And at this point, I think it's just planetary build speed. Well, no, defense platform damage too, so we'll get that sorted. Uh, all right, really at this point, I need to be thinking about uh, how I'm going to get my fleets in position for the upcoming battle. Uh, we've got lots that we can do on TAC then, so, um, we've already got the energy nexus, that's good. Um, yeah, actually, you know what, this is the funny thing, I'm actually kicking it down the road for two of the, no, 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 well, this is the time I should actually be building more, um, this is the time I should be building more refineries. <laughs> These guys, we need more scientists because I just gave them a whole bunch of pops from other worlds. But that's fine because it's, again, it's the breadbasket and science. Um, I'm also sitting on a whole bunch of... Actually, at this point, uh, let's get the remaining destroyers. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. An agreement, uh, the agreement that we signed giving you access to our databanks has run its course. Would you like to extend it for another ten standard years, or do your researchers no longer require the information we offer? Five thousand for ten years, that's an excellent deal. Okay, so we've got ten. I think it was twenty-four that I needed for my current fleet template. Construction completed. Nope, just 20. So. Now, of course, the dilemma here is I need to figure out what the hell else I want to do with these bases, but that's a decision for later. I don't have infinite amounts of alloys. Surveyor arc uh, activated. We have swept our space with a strong scanning beam on, uh, of the Surveyor Relic, and a previously unknown deposit has been found identified on Atherox 2. All right. Not the most convenient placement, but it gives my construction ship something to do. Okay, so here I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna go through some of my star bases and see if I can build some more anchorages. 
Yeah, I should probably be making sure that these ones don't have any trading opportunities too, so. I may have to give up a few of the... a few of the improvements. Mm -hmm. Murist, um... I'm not that excited by two or three for tra Oh, but this doesn't give me anything. Uh, same story with these guys. We can go all Anchorage. BM... Again, it's not really a defensive uh, sector anymore, but I don't want to mess around with my infrastructure too much. We know exactly what that one's for. Okay, it's actually not as... It's not as disastrous as they thought it would be. Uh, Landine... I mean, nine trade isn't... Terrible. I can't believe I'm doing this. Uh, yeah, I'll build it. Okay. Vimas. I always like it when I have an anchorage in place. Uh, if I was going to build one trade... Ship upgrades applied. Got to be consistent. Uh, I always like it when I have at least one anchorage built because it allows me to uh, to get that nice little upgrade. Uh, ocean, hey? So they're going to be on their way to fact. It is a shame. I was really hoping that this thing would be would be over by now. Um, okay. Elizir. At the very least, I can give them the upgrade. Nice. Okay. I actually have something I can do with this. So this will also be a nice little indicator for myself in terms of what my uh, what my limits on, uh, on expansion are. Um, because at this point, I don't really have... Um, I don't have any especially reliable ways of improving is my, the key um, to the universe. my naval capacity. So at this point, I need to start thinking about what my... Uh, what my costs for for some of this stuff is going to be uh, okay the basic mechanics of ship shields are complex but they can be adjusted and improved in a multitude of ways we're discovering many of them now so we'll get the extra energy credits because it's the cheapest tech cross-linking weapon systems to fire in staggered volleys improves the actual damage output of military stations over time i'm going to wait till all the other upgrades are in place before i start messing around with the defensive um uh, platforms again looks like it's defense platform hull points which is the laggard and i am going to do the tedious work of building 34 corvettes Just enough. All right. Uh, so it looks like most of my fleets are on their way to the bad guys. It's the, the sails upgrading the river, I'm actually I'm a little surprised. But I guess they're being blocked by the sail right now. Um, these guys are ready to go. So, I mean, at this point, the question is, I already know that I'm much stronger than my opponent. Um, so do I want to start without having access to my full military? Uh, or do I, do I want to hold out for the possibility that this war will be, um, will end 
in in sort of a neutral uh, like the white piece um i think what i'm gonna do i'll wait for the fleet that was on uh i think i'll wait for the fleet that Research was on its concluded. way to uh to take fact once that's done we'll we'll kick it off uh, iterating on the standard conditioning regimen for ground troops has proven to make them more effective in direct combat. Uh, okay, we've got the strange loop again. So it's actually going to be hard to build all of these things. Um, Ship upgrades applied. Given that we've invested so much in building all of this extra stuff. Um, but we, I don't know, we'll make it work. Uh, so I believe Research it's just concluded. one... Yeah, it's just the river that's... Uh, upgrading now. Uh, Omega Theory, a set of social protocols based on the para uh, on paradoxical intuition and on love. When we know the system of the loop, we learn that we can influence by receiving instructions as well as giving them. So we really have any anything we want here. I'm going to do the duration just for the ones. So again, absolutely nothing to, to worry about as far as the ambitions are concerned. Uh, but it is occasionally nice if I have some... Or actually, research subsidies, I think, are permanent now. Um, so things like, you know, education campaign, terraforming campaign, or so recycling campaign. Not having to spend this sort of stuff is nice. It actually looks like we're going to be getting near the ends of uh, of some of these soon anyway. So I'm going to have to keep the, the money and the influence aside. Speaking of influence, I can go shopping for a new planet. Um, so the eastern, the eastern territories don't excite me that much. Uh, I was really trying to get this system so that I could take the the empty system. That didn't work out, so. I'll take what I can, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go too hard on some of this. You'd like to buy that planet, please? Uh, preferably one with lots of islands. Gotta have your beaches. We will give you a custom-designed Gaia world, on the condition that you have federations and you can get that origin. Okay, uh, let's launch the armies. Again, at this point, this is just a matter of waiting for everybody to get into position. Waiting does give me the nice advantage of um, building up my forces, but also uh, getting a last little bit of influence um, just so I can I can scoop up some extra planets. And again, you never know if something weird happens, if for whatever reason um, these two sides get tired, sufficiently tired, I can invite the Nebrites. Um, but uh, honestly, at this case, here again i'm going for white pieces um anything that my allies get to take off of the menjusana is something that's ultimately going to make them stronger within the the federation which is not what i want Technically, this is the point that I would be finishing, um, but I appreciate uh, you guys hanging around on the smaller stream. So what I'm going to try and do is at least get the... I'm going to try at least get the war started, and that way we'll have something nice, a nice fireworks show to start off with. Pirate sighted! Our trade route in the Finn system is poorly protected and passes through what has largely become lawless space. An increasing number of pirate smugglers and other uh, various other criminal elements have been drawn to the system, and now they raid our shipping with near impunity. They must be dealt with. Knowledge well, is the key <laughs> they picked the, the worst possible time to start stuff <laughs> as, the, uh, as the patrol shows up. Wait, wh where are Space you going? Under fire. <laughs> Get back there! <laughs> now we know why we have smugglers. Jesus Christ, what are you doing? Stop! Alright, what's their route? Um... Hmm. 
That is kind of hilarious that happened. <laughs> Uh, additional layers of armor plating within the structure itself improves the resilience of military stations. Planetary build speed is the obvious candidate if we're going for the cheapest stuff. And the Senate is now in session. Okay, so this was the Guardian Angels Act. So I think I was in line with this because of... Um, it reduced the diplomatic weight from fleet power. Um, actually, yeah, so this is the question. Why would I want to continue supporting soldiers that dis dedicate their lives to keeping our planet safe should be recognized and honored? Okay, so I get 15885 from fleets. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely changing changing my tune on this one. I'm now an opponent. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Ship look look at that. Applied. That is the that is the influence I hold. One might say I am the Senate. Uh we may still lose that, but um Okay, I think the river was my size 200 fleet. That it is. Okay, so we're basically ready to kick this thing off. Like I said, though, um, once we have something in Aspira, we can uh, we can start construction the completed. <laughs> Um, there is an argument for me to make, especially with these very large trading um, uh, trade value spot. Actually, you know what? Yeah, this is not necessarily the smartest choice that I've made, um, but I am kind of drowning in resources, so I'm gonna just go over my research cap. concluded. Uh, so exceeding your starbase capacity will cause your starbases to have an increased upkeep cost. Whoa! I haven't seen the Rexar entity uh, throw its uh, its weight around. I actually kind of want to see what's going on with that. Um, so exceeding your starbase capa uh, capacity will cause your starbases to have increased upkeep cost. The starbase capacity is increased by your number of pops and own systems, and also by certain technologies and traditions. So. I mean, I'm doing okay for energy and for alloys right now. I probably don't want to do something crazy, like have every system I own have a, a star base. Um, but I think at this point, you know, systems that have over 100 trade value, this is, it's actually probably been this way for a while. Um, I probably at this point should be like building, building star bases on them. Okay, so let's see what the deal was. Oh, you know what? We're probably not going to see it. So resolutions, um, charter of workers, light, da, da. So, uh, that would be higher diplomatic weight from POPs, higher worker happier, happiness, and higher worker political... That's communism. Uh, I think I might have actually supported that. Five-year plans greater than ourselves. <laughs> um, I really do want to get involved in this, but again, I've been using all of my... Uh, I've been using all of my political muscle for... Uh, to make claims on my neighbors' territories, so I don't get I don't get to do the fun political stuff until I stop doing that. 
Um, minor improvements to transmission efficiency adds up to sizable reduction in overall energy loss. So we'll do the Omega alignment because it's cheap. And I think it's time to get the party started. So if I wanted, I can try and get some of these other systems in terms of claims. This is actually a mega structure, so this is one that I do want to gobble up. Uh, obviously, the more aggressive I get with my claims, the more uh, more at risk I am of not completing it, but we already know how this is going to go. Uh, so why can't I declare war? And it's the new Yilkahan Khanate that will join them, but I don't really have a lot to fear from them. They're all in the same area, so... There is the question, of course, as to whether or not my allies come along. So let's see how the vote goes. This is a declaration of war. <laughs> Created for good, yet so twistedly evil. How were you so corrupted? All right. So at this point, we want to work pretty, pretty quick. Um, the ideal, the ideal situation for us, of course, is that we take all of the war object, uh, war objectives, before they can respond, and then we white peace. Um, whether or not that actually happens is another question. But and yeah, between the three of us, we pretty much just killed that. Construction completed. All right, so this starbase, yeah. I think at this point I'm gonna have to ignore infrastructure for a bit. Engaging hostile station. Uh, Omega alignment. When a temporal paradox becomes tangled, a kind of consciousness arises with its own needs, its own desires. This is what occurred when the consciousness uh, that some call the worm in waiting. Sorry. This is what has occurred with the consciousness that some call the worm in waiting. If we can align ourselves with that consciousness, we might just achieve a kind of immortality. And let's give that the energy attack. So I do want to keep an eye in terms of where the, you know, where the enemy fleets are. Um, they are actually going to be able to take some systems off me, which isn't great. Hmm. Actually, that's a... That is a risk that I didn't properly account for, because if I want to white piece it out, they might have claims on these systems, and as a result, they get them. Uh, but that's fine. I have, uh, I have another way of getting around that. Okay, so... At this point, I'm really just interested in uh, taking whatever systems I can. There's a specific reason why I did this pattern. The idea is that I'm going to have another fleet which comes and takes that system by the time uh, by the time uh, they get there. The Juggernaut is a lot slower to move, so I'm just kind of getting them on cleanup duty. Now, one risk with this approach is that I am leaving my army completely exposed, but if they are able to get a fleet through here, uh, past the, you know, past the, the main, main fleets that I'm sending on their way, uh, I've got other problems. Also, I think I screwed up with one of my fleets. Let's take, um, um, the 13th Pelagic Excursion. 
think I'm going to send them to run some interference. I may actually wind up sending them off Research uh, to concluded. defend Kuzom if it comes to it. More aggressive information campaigns improve the populace's receptiveness to edicts. So let's say we'll do army damage. So the thing that always makes me nervous here is when I don't see when I don't see enemy ships. I am stronger than them, but I'm not completely unstoppable, so I uh, I do want to be a little careful in terms of how far... There we go. All right. So ideally, I'm going to tie these guys up on nonsense fights so I don't actually need to take these on. Knowledge I'm definitely going to need more to than one universe. fleet to handle this. Um, Construction completed. All right, so we'll say the core nonsense. Oh, that's right, that's right, because it's the capital. Uh, we haven't taken the planet. All right, so this has slowed down considerably. Uh, I really should have thought that through. But that's fine. Um, what we'll do, uh, I should be able to do the sudden jump to Menjusana. We should be able to claim... I mean, this is also their capital world, so let's make sure that we have the... Oh, did they have Doomed World as well? All right, so they've got a garrison 241... 2208. Okay! Um, there is some serious firepower on these worlds. Um, so, let's show them what we're made of. Our forces are making planet fall. Uh, the application of game and puzzle theory has the potential to greatly optimize modular assembly and construction. So here, let's say we're going to go for... I gotta do the kinetic weapons just because so many of my frontline ships handle that. Um, the real plan on this one, and I mean it's so silly uh, given how strong I am in comparison. The real thing I'm trying to do here is avoid losing ships, and it's just because it's really inconvenient to build new ships and get them out to the front lines. Um, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm sort of taking the approach that I am here, trying to take ridiculously unfair fights. Um, and try to give them something to think about. So I don't know what these guys completed. are doing. If I'm lucky, they're actually going to start heading after the Akano. Uh, Okay, good news on the invasion. Looks like most people are pretty healthy. Um, the thing is that it's a 2.5k uh, strength army. And like I said, I don't like taking fair fights. So what we'll do here, we'll initiate the jump to Menjusana right away. Uh, at the very least, I can take the easy target, in this case Menjus, with its 241 garrison. Um, for the rest of us, uh, we're going to bomb the heck out of the out of the station. And this will probably take a while. Um, that is not... That is not a reality I'd like to deal with, but it is unfortunately the one that I have. I, and again, this is completely on me. I should have I should have thought, you know, it's one thing for me to say I take Menjusana and everything behind it. Uh, it's a whole other matter to actually... Um, it's a whole other thing to actually claim the capital world with the size of the army that I have. 
Um, there is actually kind of an argument for me to go on something like Vimas and just create sort of a suicide squad to throw at those uh, at those worlds. But of course, that makes my attrition go up. So um, I will try and make time work in my favor. But like I said, I really want to see what's going on with uh, with these guys. It is actually so. Let me put it to you this way: it is not actually a bad result for me if the cooperative of Menjusana claims all of these worlds from the Akano. Um, because if my intention is to vassalize them ultimately, these are worlds I get. And I mean, it is the Akano's job to protect their own territory, right? <laughs> uh, we'll see whether or not that actually works out. So what I'm probably going to wind up doing here uh, while I wait for these uh, bombing campaigns to to sort of do their do their thing um, once we've claimed Menjuice, speaking of are you actually doing the thing yet? No. Uh, once they claim Menjuice, what I'm probably going to do is I'm just going to get them to jump directly to uh, Akinar. Um so with that in mind, let's say we do something like that. I could also, of course, um, I could uh, boost up the uh, the bombing the bombing rate. Um, that increases the collateral damage, though, and I want to I want to take these things for myself. It looks like the core isn't bombing someone. Uh, does it say which one is the capital? I guess this is the capital. Um, Our forces are making planet fall. So again, I am reasonably confident in my ability to win most of these fights anyway, even if we didn't uh, soften them up. But I would much prefer to have an army that is in solid shape, ready to take out the opponent, uh, and just sort of heal between rounds. Um, rather than, uh, than someone who's going to get... Uh, you know, going to get whittled down planet to planet. And again, I mean, we're going to take the capital off of them. <laughs> it's, it's... Research concluded. Okay. Um, it's been a while since I've had this food uh, surplus. So we're going to do the only sensible thing. We're going to encourage growth everywhere. No, we're not. Oh, right, because we're robot people. It's even less reason for me to to hold on to all of this. Oh, that's right. Now I've got a surplus of energy credits. Good Lord. Uh, I need to find better things to spend this money on. I'm pretty sure I wasted a whole lot of money there. Um, okay. As you can see, I'm clearly getting... I'm getting to the silly point. Uh, I'll give you the extra army health. And I guess I should deal with the massive unemployment. Um, and I'm almost half an hour over. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, let's go to the end of the invasion on the capital world. And I will at least... Well, you know what? Okay. Let's wait for the invasion to finish. I will deal with the unemployment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the next few steps are going to be. And then More report. Enemy planet secured. Perfect. So that's their home world. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, let me deal with the unemployment and then we can talk about what our next steps are going to be probably next week. I really like Age of Wonders Planet Fall, but I feel like it wouldn't be bad for me to wrap up this playthrough before uh, jumping back. So again, same story here. I'm really just 
finding uh, finding any systems that have uh, jobs available. Sorry, job um, jobs and uh, uh, space for workers. And if I can, um, I am prioritizing planets um, with uh, that aren't uh, ecumenopolises and ones that have housing for those workers as well. Although I have a feeling that I'm going to be I'm going to be testing the limits of that uh, requirement. One of the things that's also kind of nice, if the Raxar entity gets too heavily involved in some of these conflicts, uh, we will probably wind up with a lot of refugees coming our way. Um, it is a perverse but awesome system that I've got in place where because I'm allied with a hive mind, but I am quite a tolerant um, uh, sort of empire, the... So basically, the hive mind will always force people off of their worlds. And so um, I get a strong ally who is busy conquering these other areas, and the displaced people are um, wind up within my borders to obviously be able to work in my alloy factories and make my, you know, make my empire strong enough to do uh, to make war. <laughs> um, this is probably this is like so. Crusader Kings 2 is the clearly the best game for saying these completely horrifying things as if they were quite natural. Um, but these, like, I am quite aware of the system that I have developed in Stellaris, and I am utterly appalled by its implications, uh, but incredibly happy with how it is how it is really charged by my economy. Um, so again, really what I'm just doing here is um, the reason I'm prioritizing ones with a lot of slack in the job market and um, uh, space for them is that these are the planets that are probably going to require the least management after um, after the fact. So like this one's got five slots available and 11, uh, 11 workers free. So uh, now four slots, so three. Um, so the ideal out of doing something like this is, uh, what I wind up with are a bunch of systems where I have, uh, new, I have new buildings that I need to build, but I don't have, um, I don't have to worry about messing around with unemployment or anything. I think I messed up, uh, the system though. So again, we're ignoring Ecumenopoli because they are... They're pretty much insatiable as far as their appetite for workers is concerned. Um, and I don't want that to become sort of the... Like, in the end, the other planets aren't going to grow as quickly. The point of doing all of this... Um, the point of doing all of these transfers is to um, to try and get my planets to grow a bit faster than they normally would. And I messed up on a Swiri, so... Um, okay, so that should mean we don't have any more unemployment for now. Uh, or if we do, that it's caused by specialization. Now, some of these, um, you know, some of these building icons, some of these uh, population icons uh, were there before, uh, before the changes. But here's what I'm able to do. Um, I can now say, okay, well, let's say um, we'll replace... The farm. Actually, technically, I don't need to do that. Yes. No, I still need to do that. Um, we'll upgrade. Uh, and while I shouldn't, I am actually going to hammer all of these. So this is going to be another example of a world with lots of lots of jobs available and lots of um, slack in the labor market. But it's a Gaia world, so I probably want to have that as developed as possible. Um, okay. Also, uh, unemployment I find a little bit easier to deal with. Um, first, because in the end it gives me an idea in terms of what uh, 
what I'm giving up to achieve certain goals. So like, here's a great example of, of one that's a bit of a frustrating um, division to work with. So I've got one job available, which means I've basically got a total of three houses that require um, uh, so I have, a, I have a shortfall of three houses. Um, I really don't want to have to give up the energy that I'm generating mm. from that. Um, but I also really don't want to have a lack of housing on some of, some of my main production worlds. Um, the other thing too is looking forward. I'm going to have, I'm going to get rid of the robot assembly plants uh, and replace it. I really don't want to make it a repli complex, but I might just because it is technically my industrial world and it seems just as well that I have a focused industrial world. Um, but uh, the reason why I'm not getting rid of the robot assembly plants yet is that it's giving me workers for other planets. Basically, once I'm full up on all the other planets, then I'll consider getting rid of the robot assembly plants. For the time being, I think it's better that I, uh, that I, I generate these cases of, of more unemployment. Uh, in order to, um, in order to, sort of, um, what, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, I'm okay generating this unemployment and this cost of of uh, moving all of the different workers, because in the end, it's maximizing my population growth, which of, is of course uh, maximizing my uh, economic growth. Uh, I'm getting the inputs to production. You know, most of my I can remember when I used to have over ten planets with vacancies of over 10 um, and now I'm being a little more efficient in terms of how I'm uh, how I'm allocating those resources and I'm I'm generally I'm growing at a uh, something I'm growing at a fast pace but I'm I'm able to uh, I'm able to get sort of the priorities it's also making me a little bit more nimble in terms of responses to things so obviously now knowing what I do know uh, I'm I would prefer to uh, expand my minerals over my food if I can we'll see if that turns out of course but Idris Secundus. so this is a Nope, it is not an ambiguous case. That definitely needs another city district. Okay, so that's the crowding dealt with. Uh, the last thing that we need to do is build all our fancy new, uh, all our fancy new buildings. So this one is not hard to figure out at all. It's a science world. It's, it is what it is, right? Um, as weary. Uh, this one is actually a little bit more tricky because we were doing a balancing act of jobs relative to um, relative to sort of specialized uh, um, you know strategic resource generation. I think in this case here I'm going to bite the bullet. At some point I actually want to build a galactic stock exchange given how much trade we're generating. Um, but this is not the time because I only get two merchant jobs. So we'll start with a commercial zone, then we'll do a stock exchange. Um, Henteron. So these guys sort of leveled out in terms of their job. Uh, see, this is the thing. It's all well and good for me to balance out housing like that, but I'm still going to need to give up one of the mines. Um, so how do we get you to the next level? Uh, for the time being, we do not... I get two trader... Yes, that works. Um, because we have three vacancy... Oh yeah, yeah, we're already on our way to seven. Okay, no, we're good, we're good. Um, oh god, what do I want to do with you? Um, I still feel like I need more moats than I need exotic gases. Um, so, but, yeah, and we already have our exchange, so. Chemical plants, it is. And I might as well upgrade this building. And this one. All right, Garam. Um, 
This one I was a little bit smarter in leaving some of these districts open. And I have not yet built a commercial zone. So energy first, and then... Um, yeah, I'm doubling down on the chemical plants. Sol is a no-brainer. It's a science world through and through. I can't remember what made it that... Oh, no, I remember. It's the um, ancient particle accelerator. Gives me a physics bonus. Pretty much every world that's a science-focused world has some other bonus, so this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm stacking on as many benefits as I possibly can on these... Uh, on these planets um, is that they they're sort of naturally endowed with um, with a science advantage and then you know to to sort of sweeten the deal um, there's also other uh, other improvements so I feel a little bad wait a minute <laughs> sorry for some reason I thought that was a stock exchange um, I am an idiot all right, um, I think we're going to do the same story here. I want to do volatile moats. And knowing that I need to get to 75, I think I'm just going to accept it and uh, build another bigger megaplex. Um, of course, all the extra trade that I'm generating through these uh, um, commerce megaplexes and stock exchanges and whatnot, um, this is the point where I'm going to th think about dismantling a couple of my consumer goods worlds um these guys are pretty much at the end of their rope um so i'm just going to get them set up with a chemical refinery plant and i think we're just going to ship everyone else off world we've already got the dust deserts this is this worked for us right it's combination uh, moat production and alien zoos <laughs> not a combination i would have thought i'd see in the game but there you have it uh, now, the um, resort world has actually turned out surprisingly well. Um, so we're short on... Uh, we're short on living space again. So I suppose we can start with that. Actually, that's maybe the way that I handle this. Um, so let's start by building enough luxury residences to give people um, places to stay and let the let the planet grow, and then when we run into employment problems, we just build another commerce center. And the reason I want to do that is if I can, um, oh, it won't let me, will we? Okay, I was gonna say, I could get really sneaky and produce a, uh, um, I get really sneaky and produce a, uh, uh, a stock exchange with all the malls, but I think the game anticipated that. Uh, so I'm okay with Meneth um, being being a gap. And uh, we have sort of set ourselves up for... Um, we've set ourselves up for a pretty strong position at the... Uh, why won't you upgrade? Oh, because it's not mine yet. Um, yeah, so I think we've positioned ourselves pretty well economically. Um, this is going to be... No, hang on. What are you telling me to upgrade then? How odd. Um, so at some point I do need to properly go through my, uh, my star bases, get them sorted out with anchorages. Uh, I probably need to really serious, like take my, um, my patrols more seriously because they have definitely not succeeded at reducing piracy to a level that I need. Um... But on the other hand, I've got... Oh my god, we've got room for another Titan already? Alright, well, let's not stand on ceremony. Let's get that thing in the queue. 
the good news is it's all Corvettes that are getting pushed out. So, in fact, I'm going to do one better. I won't build the destroyers yet, but basically we've got all the capital ships for our next uh, our next fleet all ready to go. We are almost certainly going to go blasting through the naval capacity, and then on top of that, I have what is it um, for the core, of the ocean, the sail, uh, the pelagic, uh, well the the two. Um, so that's one. What is it? One, two, three, four, five. So that's two hundred points uh, to get them up to the fleet cap of two hundred and thirty, and then another thirty. Um, to get the river up. So, okay, so we're at... Okay, so I have basically another whole fleet worth of um, naval capacity uh, to bring everyone up to, up to standard. And then, of course, I've got another uh, fleet on the way, which is currently being built for 190. Um... So that means I think I'm going to have to add another 260 to my um, uh, to my my navy, uh, whereas of course we've got about 120 worth available. But again, um, again, it like I don't have infinite amounts of money. My energy credits now have fallen. Um, so you know there is a. There is a reasonable question as to whether or not building uh, the Aswiri station was uh, was justifiable. Um, on the other hand, uh, I will say that um, we have a we have a project. No, it wasn't here. Utan. Uh, so in 198 days, our strategic coordination center should be coming online. Um, or at least the next stage, but we, we've got another, we've basically got something that will uh, help my capacity a bit, and so that's going to uh, that's kind of going to be uh, helping save me. Actually, you know what? If it's 197 days, I did I did say that I was going to um, recap everything. I'm already an hour over, um, or close to. Uh, let's see this thing. Let's see this thing through to the end. Construction completed. So I want to be careful about this. Um, I've lost track of where the scary fleets are. Um, but if I can, um, if I can take some, basically, if I can take some uh, uh, some systems off of them that will distract them, so much the better. Uh, perched at the event horizon of Zubiac's Maw is a matter decompressor, a mega structure designed to mine materials uh, from a black hole. While it's no longer fully functional, its gravitational twist uh, engine must still be operational as it has not suffered spaghettification. Oh man. And it looks like they are actually on their way to completing that, so that's going to be really cool that I, uh, I take that away from them. So right now, claiming this system is uh, specifically designed to give my army something to do. Knowledge is the key to the universe. Okay. These are reasonably strong fleets that I want to keep an eye on. If they start heading towards uh, Akronar, I'm in a bit of trouble. If they head towards um, sort of my main forces on Menjusana, then I'm okay. This is, of course, one of the reasons why the Juggernaut is holding back. So we'll see, we'll see how these guys respond, uh, or don't respond. So it looks like they're just staying put. Now this actually isn't necessarily that bad of an idea for them, um, because this is a system that I've put a claim on, and so I'm not going to be able to enforce my, uh, I'm not going to be able to enforce my demands. 
if uh, if there are sort of contested war goals still, or at least it's harder for me to enforce them. Of course, for them, or f for me, I am not that worried that I can't, uh, like, completely beat them. Uh, what I'm looking for here is the white piece that gives me the territories I want. All right, energy weapon damage plus 5%. Perfecting the firing cadence of laser, laser weaponry is a task that could keep the engineering elite of any given planet busy for centuries, and it is... Um, let's keep going. We'll do the attack speed as is tradition. All right, so that's us claiming Menjus. That's working as intended. How are the armies looking? 21-23 and... 18-45. Eh, so this is definitely going to be the one that falls first, but I am quite content to... Wait a bit. So it's... A, this is a bit of a dicey um, situation I find myself in. So here's the broad plan for taking this system. Uh, we take Akmar. We... Uh, sorry, is that... That's probably... Uh, Akernar. Um, I believe I should be able to get the... Uh, the jump, so anything within this dotted yellow line is fair game. Um, so far, so good. What is the worry, though, is I move my fleet in position. These guys decide, okay, this will not stand. They move in. Uh, and now I have the ocean, which admittedly is 97,000 strength, so, you know, they're... Their combined fleet will definitely take some points off of me, but it's it's not like, you know, they're definitely going to be the ones who are worse off for that encounter. Um, but it does force me to, to actually take that fight because I do not want to lose my army. It's the only army I have. Um, and so the this is kind of the this is the big danger of having them in this position, given how loss averse. Uh, I am with my fleets uh, this is actually allowing so essentially what's happening is that these two fleets are doing more to defend their territory by just simply sitting there in a position where they can defend themselves uh, than they are actually coming in and taking on my guys um, but of course I, I know this is what uh, how I'm responding and what they're doing. So I, I do have some plans. Um, Research concluded. Right, high density munitions five. Ultra dense slugs can punch through even the strongest of projected shields. So this is. Um. I'm not opposed to getting more minerals, uh, but I do like going aggressive, and I think we were saying that my titans are very missile heavy. So what I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to see what happens when I move my fleet uh, aggressively against them. If I can take out the, if I can take out the base and they don't move. Um, then I'm going to commit the, then I'm going to commit the soldiers, and at that point, I make them last for 200 days. Uh, that's all that I need. Uh, anything past that, not my worry. Uh, it's, I'm also interested in the size of that army. So that's a size 164 army. So that's not that threatening on its own. Uh, and again, of course, one of the so. The reason why I wanted to take the time to highlight uh, exactly what was going on in terms of me feeling a little pressure about taking this, um, there is an argument to be made for me keeping the standoff going, uh, because what it means is that I get to continue bombing this and taking out their defense forces. Um, the trick is, though, is the longer I wait, the more they get to consolidate their fleets and they start, you know, then they get to pick an engagement that might work better for them. So, 
We've stepped her space with a strong scanning beam from the Surveyor Relic and found a previously unknown resource deposit on Yoman 6A. So that's trade power. That'd be nice, but it's uh, it's not quite what I need right now. All right, so this is not too scary. So I'm just setting them up with the base in order to get a little... Uh... In order to get the... Um... Uh, to get whatever repairs. All right, so here we're good to land the armies. I am, of course, very curious to see if they've made any changes. Nope, they're staying put. And at this point, it looks like I'm just completely bullying them on this side of the map, so. Although I did see something just slip into the Tetis system. That's a little worrying. Um, again, the main fleets are where they need to be. Um, but I would have preferred to keep an eye on, on where the potential threats are. I always just look at these reports to see if I lost any ships. Um, so what I need to be looking at here is... Um, in the best case scenarios, I find something where I can get some easy wins against the AI, but I don't necessarily wind up getting caught in a corner. Because again, if they have one strong... Uh, fleet that kind of comes out of nowhere, all of a sudden I'm on the run. Uh, I am, of course, going to go for a completely reckless little journey on the side here. Uh, the only thing is I do need to take a second and see, you know, where everything else is in relation to each Construction other. Construction completed. Also, I kind of want to be careful of these because if they wind up being Akano um, claims, then I'm just going to be sad. Our forces are making planet fall. Okay, I'm gonna go completely brazen on this one. Um, so again, this is one of these ones where I want to be very careful on what. Um, what's happening in the uh, in the system um, so if, if I get any indication that this fleet is on the move I need to I need to get out but if I can unite these fleets in Menjusana then I'm laughing war report enemy planet secured perfect Um, so I don't see any benefit in sticking around. Well, I mean, taking this planet might be nice, but I think it's better that I focus on... I think it's better that I focus on the war goals. I'm mildly curious how close I am to settling status quo. So it's minus 12 right now. Um... I think, uh... I'm almost certain when I take the capital world, uh, that's the uh, that's the end of their their holding out for um, for settled status quo. Obviously, I want to try and get as much as I can um, because the aim here is to try and uh, try and soften their economy. I mean, again, getting planets is nice, um, but the aim on this one is to soften the economy so that the next war is a war of subjugation rather than a war of um, of conquest. Um, also, my tendency to pause is... Wow, I've cut my energy in half with those star bases. 
I kind of need that thing to go online a lot sooner than I thought I did. 25 days. Also, there's a new measure. The enemy of my enemy. An enemy of one is an enemy of all. If any of our number is attacked, should we not permit any of our number to punish the offender? Grants the counterattack, Casus Belli, on empires that are not galactic community members and are in an offensive war against a galactic community member. So diplomatic weight from fleet power plus 60%, naval capacity plus 30, but a higher ship upkeep? Oh, hell yes. Um, I would actually go so far as to say that could potentially be something that I do as an em uh, emergency uh, measure. That is a very, very strong bonus uh, for the position that I'm in. I mean, it, could, it potentially uh, bites me if for whatever reason I get kicked out of the Galactic community. I don't actually know how that happens, um, but I'm a Galactic Council member, for God's sakes. Like, it's, it, that's a pretty, that is a pretty um, spectacular turn of events if I suddenly find myself out in the cold on that one. Engaging hostile forces. Okay, that was a little unexpected, but... Ah, crap. All right, I'm a little worried about these... That's ah, a 61 size flea. Okay. Um, I was a little worried about the fact that they were bringing an army. Um, there we go. The Strategic Coordination Center, operational. The final additions to the Strategic Coordination Center are several detached hostile force simulator bastions. These bastions contain much of the functionality of the Strategic Coordination Center on a smaller scale, but are completely independent of the main system. Within, elite commanders and their staff can become totally immersed in the culture and traditions of our enemies, and by studying their artwork, can better understand and simulate their military thinking. Once fully immersed, they will fight virtual wars against the staff of the Strategic Coordination Center, allowing us to simulate conflicts with any possible enemy in excruciating detail, which can then be studied from the perspectives of both sides and our strategies refined upon. Okay, so that is just a cool idea on its own, in addition to being something that gives me some pretty good bonuses. Have I really already... I was not expecting to... Plus six starbase capacity though, so I feel like I should have more. Apparently not, um, but this will hopefully help my uh, this will help helpfully help my cash situation, and it will also hopefully um, give me a little bit more leeway as far as the uh, as far as my fleet expansion is concerned. Um, but I've definitely gotten an image of how quickly my economy can unravel in its current state. So I think I want to be a little more careful moving forward. I will admit I'm a little unsure why... Oh, right, because they wanted to blow up the wanted to blow up the visitor. Okay, so we've got about a strength 700 advantage over these guys. Um, and we will have a what? I actually, okay, it's a wimpy move to make, but I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna wait on committing my, my army. Um, I do kind of want to wrap this thing up sooner rather than later, but I don't see an advantage in throwing my soldiers away like that. So, um, here's what the plans are going to be for the next uh, stream, which I suspect probably it's going to be Stellaris next week. Uh, obviously, we need to finish up the, the war with Cooperative Menjusana. The sooner we end the war, the sooner we can get started on the next one. However, as far as claims are concerned, we still have, you know, a whole a whole batch here. I will probably be willing to give up um, 
I'll probably be willing to say I don't need to take um, uh, Stir, uh, Styridon. Um, I would prefer not to engage, um, you know, the combined strength of about 90k. Uh, just because I know that that's going to be a case where I lose some ships and I'd rather not lose ships. I'd rather just be building new ones and upgrading the ones that I have. Um, the good news, of course, is, is that when I take a look at the systems that I want, um, all the ones that I've, like, have otherwise claimed, uh, these are trivial to pick up. Um, unless there's some huge army on, uh, okay, it's not going to tell me. Yeah, so, like, unless it turns out that, um, Riodore has, you know, has the real... You know the real nightmare as far as uh, as far as um, armies are concerned. In this case, this is really just a matter of wearing them down. And like I said, I do have an I do have an army that is capable of sweeping these guys aside. Um, you know, numerically, um, I I kind of hold all the cards. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I've got two systems with armies of about two thousand strength, a bit less on on this world now. Uh, and it's not just that I'm going to want to be taking them both down, but I'm going to want to be taking them down in, you know, reasonable, reasonably quick succession. Um, so the drawback here, of course, is that there's going to be some collateral damage as ne devastation goes up. I'm going to start seeing some of these things get knocked down. Clearly, it's the fortresses that are uh, are, are causing me such uh, such grief. Um, and again, part of this is just me exercising some some judgment you know i i could have taken a look i guess i couldn't on this one because i can't see the planet um i probably could have been taking a look at the the planets i was taking capital worlds are obviously never easy um so it's a slower progress than i was thinking but um again the real aim here is once i get the settle status quo um uh, it's up to me to decide when I want to pull the trigger on it. And to my view, um, I think the way that I'm going to handle it, I want to try and get as many of the things as I can. Uh, if I get any indication that the uh, the fight between these two federations is about to wrap up, uh, I would consider ending this war early so that I can vassalize the Neborite Republican territories. With maybe the exception of taking uh, the Menjasana system. That one's a, a pretty high priority for me. Anyways, um, lots to lots to think about for uh, the next stream. Thank you for... Obviously, this is a smaller cast. Um, I'm assuming partly because I was... Uh, I was rather late starting. I will admit, though, um, I don't 100% know what's going on, um, but for a while it's obviously been something that I couldn't count on people uh, following every every stream, and that's not always been a problem. Usually there's been like a big event that brings in lots of other people, um, but what I've noticed is that there is a fairly steady tick of people uh, unfollowing the stream, which is fine. Last week tonight, where is that playing? <laughs> um... So it's, again, it's not something that I want to obsess about, um, but it, it is interesting feedback, and I'm, I'm wondering if it's something specifically that I've done, or if it's just people who had previously uh, followed because of a game that I played before, uh, seeing that I haven't been playing it, and, uh, and, and wrapping it up. So, uh, but with that in mind, if you do know someone who would like the stream, or otherwise uh, you want to try and bring out the, wor the word, uh, I would appreciate that. I, I would definitely, um, I'm definitely looking to try and keep uh, a little bit of momentum going for the, the channel. And um, the first priority should always be to do a good show and to, um, to try and be as entertaining as I can. Um, but uh, it is nice to, to be able to have a few more people, uh, a few more people inside. So if you want to get the word out, I would tremendously appreciate that. Uh, the other reason why you are hearing videos in the background is I'm trying to find someone to host tonight and let's host Outworld who's currently doing Mortal Kombat actually sorry I do like Outworld but let me just take a quick look here and see is there anybody I know playing Stellaris no I would really like to, um, 
Yeah. The best I can really say for uh, Stellaris here would be if you guys are um, if you guys are interested, I do encourage you to check out um, streams down down below if you click on the Stellaris button. Um, I've had a couple of drawbacks when I've hosted uh, Stellaris games where either the person's like walked away from the computer and they never come back or they're playing a totally different game, um, but they haven't uh, haven't changed the, the game otherwise. I don't know what it is about Stellaris that's been causing that. Um, but in this case, I will pass you on to the very capable Outworld who is doing uh, Mortal Kombat 2. If you'd like, you can use the message, we were tired of system talk, heard this place was better. Outworld is a solid guy, partner streamer, and used to hold some uh, some world records in terms of speedruns for Mortal Kombat. I think some of them have been surpassed since then. Uh, but definitely a game he's very comfortable with, and as you can tell from the name of his channel, something that he's, he's quite dedicated to. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you have a good evening. Uh, I am not back on Wednesday. I'm going to have to, if you want to watch more of me, uh, there is a pre-recorded video for Morrowind, which is coming on tomorrow. Uh, that will be starting as close to 7 as I can manage it. It should already be uploaded. Uh, and if you want to see me live, uh, I will probably be back for Friday, where I don't know how close I am to the end of Outer Worlds, but it is possible we may be finishing that um, this Friday. Until next time. Um, oh, hang on. I didn't hit the raid button, so um, this is going to be awkward. I don't know. Follow the stream. Tell people to follow the stream. Say hi. Be nice to each other. And Stellaris is on sale and the Steam sale. All right. Have a good night, guys. Uh, I'll see you in Outworlds.